Today's guest is a performance strategist who works with artists, creators, and entrepreneurs to enhance their performance in business and in life. His mission is to help high achievers master themselves, their energy, self-esteem, focus, discipline, and other aspects of personal mastery. Please welcome Dion Mensink. So, damn. Dion, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thank you. That was a really nice introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> When you talk about personal mastery, what comes to your mind? Tell me what you think about it. It's fun because most people would think it's about control over yourself. Um, and sure, control plays a huge role. You have to have control over some ill impulses. But it's also about letting go or accepting. So it's not something you can discuss like in a short sentence, like what is personal mastery? Because it consists of a lot of subjects. But in short, I would say having the confidence in yourself that you will, would be able to handle every situation. That's it. Really simple. Knowing you can do it. Knowing you can get it done. Well, get it done just like Whatever happens, it's okay, and I'm okay with it. That's it. What was the, the catalyst that got you into self-development and personal mastery? Mm, I think that was on a holiday, actually. I was with my family, and my father, my mother, and my little brother and sisters. They were a little bit younger. Uh, and... I was really bored actually where we're, we were in Italy um, and I had no internet. I was, I think about 15, 16 years old. Around that age, I was into social media. I was like, oh fuck, man, I need to get online, you know? What was the websites at the time? Oh, it was Instagram already. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you were one of the OG users. Well, I don't. Hmm, now you're making me doubt. 2016, I was... I was not 16. Well, whatever. 2016, around that area. Um, I was in Italy. And I got really bored. So every day I would use used to walk up this hill because at the top of the hill, I would have a little bar of connection. Oh, that's cool, yeah. Well, cool. That's that's junky behavior, but okay. <laughs> it's, it's the addict's behavior. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Damn. And I walked up and I had this bar and I just started scrolling, doing nothing, blah, blah, blah. We all know it, right? Um, I hope not, but I think you do. And then I would just uh, add only this big bottle of water, uh, sometimes a towel against the sun because it was really uh, hot, actually. And I would just scroll, scroll, scroll a couple of hours and walk down again, eat something and went up again. It was when I talk about this it feels really weird but one day i uh, i also downloaded music you know on spotify and uh, to, because at night i would listen to music when i laid in bed and whatever not but then i stumbled upon a podcast i was like hmm. i didn't know at the time what it was um so i was like okay fuck it download it and that night i laid in bed i don't exactly remember what podcast it was But for me, it was really eye-opening because before that, I didn't encounter people who thought different than my surroundings, you know? Um, it was just the people in your surroundings or the media or whatever. But through that podcast, I discovered like, whoa, this guy, I feel that what he's saying is truth, but it was totally different from what I've been hearing before. So that... I still remember the moment as well because I, I laid in bed and I don't know if you remember your first podcast, but when you lay in bed and you hear two people talking yeah, and you're part of the conversation, yeah, that was a totally new experience. And I was like, whoa. And I agreed with the guy and I was like, whoa, I never thought about that, but he's right and blah, blah, blah. It activated me. After that, I bought some books about sales, about... Uh, Actually, I don't like the term um, self-help. Why self-help? <laughs> Do you need help, James? <laughs> I, that's why also. Maybe self-improvement? Well, personal mastery. Personal mastery. Yeah, I like that the most because to me, that's the goal. It's my 
only th- goal. But I ordered some books on self-help at the time and I just started reading. And actually, I never stopped reading. And then at what point did you decide that I'm going to go and find other high achievers and coach them and work with them to enhance their performance? Yeah, to be honest, it didn't start with high achievers. Uh, I just started with, um, I did know that I wanted to help people. So empower them, you know. So I've I've stumbled upon a, a guy who was still in high school and he, he was trying to... Uh, yeah, pass his exams, for example. And I started working with him and I started working with a, with a girl uh, who was at the time, uh, you know, it's all normal, but a bit, uh, a, she, she needed to work a bit on her confidence. And so it started with that and I rolled into it and I, I knew that I really liked it, but I also knew that I had to specify uh, my audience. Um, and I think in, I'm not exactly sure, but I think 2020, um, I decided to only work with high performers and that's when everything switched in my business. It was like, usually I would walk, uh, against a wall and after that it was like unleashed. What do you think it is about high performers that separates them from the people who maybe put up walls to their own growth? Is it an attitude? Is it a mindset? Is it innate? To be honest, I believe that a lot of people are high performers, but they don't even know it. (laughs) So I don't like to think in, oh, they are high performers and they are not. I believe the potential is in almost everyone. I agree. Of course, if if you have like brain damage or whatever, it's a, a lot harder, but then you can master yourself on other topics, you know? So... No, nah, I don't. I don't like to think in. They do got it. They don't. But, but you, some are not tapping into it. Would oh, you agree? Oh, for sure, for sure. A lot of people. And what what do you think is the some of the top limiting beliefs or blocks that hold people back? First, that comes to mind is awareness, just being conscious, like you have to know that things are possible first here if you don't see that you're not gonna do it you're never gonna do it well you might stumble upon success or achievements but it was not a conscious or strategic approach with this is my goal i'm here right now how i get from here to there and what's in my way what do i need what do i need to do what don't i need to do what do i need to stop doing I think that's the biggest part. (laughs) It reminds me of something I saw recently that we see with our mind, not our eyes. And so if you don't see it in your mind, you're actually going to be blind to it in a physical sense. You won't see the opportunity or the, the, the people or the resources that you have. I like that as well. To be honest, that is the truth because our eyes, they collect data, but our brain makes the image. For example, also for you at home, like... Did you know you see your nose all the time, but you don't really see your nose. <laughs> You're blocking it out in some Well, way. yeah, you are not doing it, but your brain is doing it automatically because it knows it's there. It's no, it knows. <laughs> it knows, it knows it's there. <laughs> so you don't need that information anymore. So it filters it out. And that shows us how malleable our world really is, you know? So I really like what you said. You. You see with your mind and not with your eyes. Yeah, I agree. And that's where I start. And that's why I love personal mastery. Because it's not about things out there. So like more than 80% of my clients, they are entrepreneurs. So they have a business. And when when you're a businessman and you're building your craft and your products and whatever not, it's your baby, you know? Yes. You want to take care of it. You want to make sure it survives and thrives. And what happens is people are like, yeah, personal mastery, this and that, but I want my business to grow. And I'm like, do you know what your business is? It's an extension of yourself. (laughs) Ah. So that's why I say personal mastery is for sure the first thing you need to focus on. But in my opinion, it's the only thing. Because also knowledge, you can use it in your business, you know, but it's internal. So yeah, I like that. 
it's a good point because unless you master yourself, you're the only one holding back your business. You're the the bottleneck for a lot of things. I think you're always your own bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Like always. Okay, it's hard. It's it's easy for me to say. Because um, when you studied this topic, when you read a lot of books, when you um, had fears but tried to overrule them, um, like I can say I'm a master at this. I love to do it. It's my passion. And for me, I know for, for myself, it's the truth. Like you're always your own biggest bottleneck. So your biggest obstacle. You have a system, right? Of, of seven building blocks of personal mastery. And yeah. I'd love to get into that with you. And could you run me through the, the concepts? Sure. Um, no, well, you, you summarized it perfectly. It consists of seven areas where I believe that if you just focus on those areas, improving those areas, you will get closer to personal mastery. That's it. And I say you get closer to personal mastery because the fact is you will never get there. It's this endless journey towards striving towards your best self, you know? And... Okay, so the first three, you, you have this foundation. It's, it consists of energy, uh, self-esteem, and worldview. And the latter four, uh, the next four, are your skills, the most fundamental skills. There are knowledge, uh, focus, discipline, and patience. So these are the seven topics. And I also use this in my work with clients, my sessions. Energy is not only like the energy in your body, but also yeah, like your spiritual energy, uh, but also the knowledge about what is energy. Like for example, a lot of people, they think about, okay, you have this, okay, James, you're over there, then we have the air, and then we have me right here, right? But no, it's one energy field. That's really important to have some knowledge of, um, as well as the law of conserving energy. Like energy cannot be made or destroyed. It can only transform. That's really, really important, but I don't know if everyone knows that. So it's the energy in your body, but also around you and the spiritual energy. Then we have self-esteem. Um, it's just how you view yourself, yourself, your relationship with yourself. And if that's healthy, yes or no. And if it's empowering you or if it's disempowering, or destructive even, you know? And then we have worldview. I like to talk about that because we live in the, the age of information, the information age. Um, worldview is about, do you have the specific uh, glasses? I, I always use the metaphor. It's like having these glasses, how you see the world. So what kind of glasses do you look through to see the world? Because we also all, almost always forgot that everyone sees the world like 100% different, mm. like everything. That's a great point. We tend to assume that people see things our way. That's a cognitive bias, actually. Yeah. I don't know the name of it, but I do know it is one. <laughs> but actually, everyone is seeing it in their own unique way, with their own traumas, their own belief systems. Yeah. And it's truly like wearing glasses with a certain, let's say, a certain color that is just coloring in everything nice, in nice. terms of red or blue. Or yeah, so if someone seeing red, the world in red, will not agree with someone seeing the world in blue. But oh. to them, it's both true. Are you referring to the Democrats and the Republicans? No, just kidding. <laughs> red and blue. No, yeah, I I agree. Um, but that's also a big problem because these days with social media, like one thought or one person can get like, with the leverage of social media, it can reach the whole world, you know? So it, it becomes harder and harder to find common ground. You know, you get all these groups, the polarization of society and whatever not. Do you also think there's this opposite problem? There's a lot of groupthink, a lot of also global of ideas that 
<laughs> become cemented, even if they're not exactly true or mm. they have no bases sure. in them, but people get hypnotized by them. For sure. Especially fears, you know? Yeah. I think it's important to know that how you feel the world will depend what you will contribute to the world. Because if you think that everyone is your enemy and everyone sucks and fuck him, fuck them, oh, uh, but we are all one. That's that's my worldview. So you can say, oh, fuck him. Yeah, but you're all connected. And it all circles back, you know? For example, when I walk into a restaurant, um, you notice this because on Bali, every, every waiter is like, hello, sir, how are you? Welcome. They're very friendly. Does that make you feel good or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? Actually, when I did a visa run and I flew out of Bali, flew back in, mm -hmm. it was such a relief to come home to Bali ah, because wow. from the moment you land in the airport, you have this vibe of friendliness, yeah. and this vibe of, oh, wow. They're like, and they're genuine about it. Like, they're actually happy. Yeah. And you're like, wow, that is such a stark contrast to the country that I went to for the visa run. <laughs> and it was like mind blowing to me. I realized Bali truly is one of the friendliest countries on earth. And I don't know how this vibe happened, but whatever they've got going on here, it's it's working. It's perfect, yeah. I love it actually, because um, people sometimes forget that one smile has this compound effect. <laughs> so true. Like. You can make someone's day with sure. a smile and you won't even know it and they might not say anything. Exactly. And what happens after that, after you leave the restaurant or after they go home to their wives or um, husbands or whatever, mm -hmm. they might treat their ch children better because that because of the one smile. You don't, you don't know, you cannot calculate it because it doesn't happen in your sight. But if you just think about it, it's really logical that it makes a difference if you you smile or if you like that like yes fuck everyone and that has to do with worldview if you know we're all one we should work together empower each other you know oh man i think we humans we play too little games we play zero sum games so zero sum like i need to win and that means you lose fuck that win win Yes. Like win, win, win. <laughs> yes. I can win, you can win, and the people we empower can win. Everyone can win. <laughs> we need to play bigger games. We need to, for example, that's why I love Elon Musk and that his, his great vision of going to Mars and space colonization and whatever not. Like, let's go. <laughs> Think big. <laughs> we, we play such small games thinking, oh yeah, doing this, more money, more money. Sure, go ahead, play your games, but that's not the people that I empower. It's hard to get people out of their worldviews as well. Once they've got those glasses on, it's almost impossible to take them off un or put new frames on yeah. unless they want to do it. Yeah. Have you noticed that in your clients and your experiences? Well, I first want to circle back to, to what you said because uh, I that's my point of uh, in 2020 that I decided, okay, from now on, I only work with high performers. Mm. And I I know from, from that moment on, I will never get a big audience. And I like that because I have a specific audience. You have to be open-minded. You have to be willing to change your mind. You have to um, not be on your phone all day. You have to be focused. You have to, well, not, of course, we, everyone has fears or whatever not, or needs to work on skills or whatever not. That's okay. You don't have to be perfect. Of course not, but open-minded kind, pure heart. Like if I notice that you're not building, but tearing things down, I will stop our uh, contract. I will not work with you anymore. Because I feel that I have this gift to spot patterns, to empower people on the next level, on a deep level. I've seen that it worked. So I have to be selective of who to work with and who I don't like to work with. But James, a little bit back, uh, circling back to the, the personal mastery model. So that was worldview. Um, the three, found the foundation consists of energy, uh, self-esteem and worldview. Those are the three main, uh, you said foundational blocks. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got 
the skills. Skills. Yeah. yeah. So focus, knowledge, discipline, and patience. So focus is the ability to galvanize. Uh, um, galvanize. Galvanize. Maybe? No, no. I mean, um, canalize. Canalize. So uh, canalizing your energy to one specific point for a longer duration of time. That's to me. That to me is focus. Then knowledge um, consists first of learning how to learn, <laughs> and then um, just getting the right knowledge for your goals. Then we have discipline. To be honest, I'm least fan of this one because um, the trick is not to discipline yourself to do stuff you don't like. The trick is to find something you like and know how to maneuver yourself that you begin to enjoy the process. Because of course you can train discipline, but discipline is like a muscle. It can also be depleted or empty, you know? So why would you focus so hard on a tool that might be depleted? And so, so what's the alternative? When discipline gets depleted, what do you turn to? realigning with what do you do and why do you do it so you're finding your essence what is your essence mm, i like that because why would you do something that you don't like and don't get me wrong of course everyone has to do the small things we don't like you know um well going outside in the cold in the netherlands it's like freezing sometimes you don't like that but yeah you need food so you need to go to the grocery <laughs> so shut up <laughs> And that's a little example of discipline. But the goal in my life is to, first I found, I'm lucky to find my passion early, but after that to realign every day. Like Steve Jobs did this also. He looked himself in the mirror daily and he used to ask himself like, is what I'm doing today, is that, well, I'm not, I don't know exactly, but is this what I want to spend my time on? Yeah. I and think it, it was like, would I do this tomorrow if I if I died today? Like, would I keep doing this? Also, yeah, exact. That's that's an example of realigning, and that's so essential. And the last one, patience. That's I like that one the most. I think. How come, James? <laughs> People are not patient anymore. Like, even a conversation is is. Is a no go. <laughs> Didn't you notice that people don't f let you finish speaking anymore? <laughs> I, I might uh, be a bit biased because I focus on these topics and I shape myself to be patient and not being on my phone all day, you know. But I really believe that I can notice in society that patience is almost non existing. Mm. Short term gratification. Like, like the, 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 the pigeons from BF Skinner, like tapping, tapping on their phones, like, uh, uh, bro, <laughs> that's to me, that's the opposite of personal mastery. The opposite. And would you say the, the highest achievers, they have mastered patience? Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. for, at least the, the highest achievers that I study because high, high achiever is, um, is a broad term. Um, I don't believe that, for example, an artist, he might need less patience. I don't know, you know? So I don't want to, I don't want to paint the picture black or white. Um, it's always nuanced or there's this play, this harmony I call. Mm, so I don't want to say it's this or that, you know, but I really believe personally, the people that I study, uh, Okay, okay, let's take a specific example. An entrepreneur, um, he has an e-commerce business, selling products online. You have to, um, he has to have patience in his business because he has to uh, write a strategic plan. He has to uh, specify his niche his market, um, the, what are the market needs? He has to focus on, okay, 
um, how, how, what's my product, how I'm gonna uh, market it, whatever, and then optimizing the system, whatever not, you know? It all takes focus, patience. So that's his work and he wants to become successful. Okay, that's cool. But after his day's day of work, he goes home, he's in the, the metro, scrolling on his phone, like instant gratification. That's okay. If you would like to do that, do that. Then at home, he grabs a bag of chips, start eating, oh, I'm hungry. Not taking good care of his body, of his system. And he uh, opens Netflix, ah, again, the dopamine rush, you know. So people tend to forget that we have one brain, <laughs> one brain. It's not, you cannot decide, okay, on the one hand, I will be long-term and focused and with a lot of patience, but once I get home, I'm only focusing on instant gratification, the short term. That's, that's in itself inefficient, in my opinion. This is a really good point, because we tend to think that we can compartmentalize certain behaviors. We can be disciplined in one area and slack off in another. But the neural net in our brain is all connected. And so you're actually training yourself to be at all times, either more disciplined, less disciplined, more patient, less patient. Yeah. Is that, I, I think that's what you're talking about as well. Exactly. Uh, I've heard the sentence, I don't know from who it is, so please let's quote him if we know. Um, how you do one thing is how you do everything. I really like that. That's also, that circles back to the smile. Doesn't matter if it's the cleaner or a CEO, I will treat you with the same respect. I don't fucking care. Like I get chills uh, on my spine when I say this because I hate this when people think they're better because they have more money or more status or more power. No, with great power comes great responsibility. Come on, <laughs> that's so basic to me, but a lot of people seem to forget that. And that that's uh, those are not the people that I work with. <laughs> Unless I can let them see the light that we are all one and how you treat one person is how you treat everyone, you know? And so Easy. would you say the guy who comes home, turns on Netflix, eats the, the snacks, what does he have to change in his mind to start behaving in a in a more consistent way? It really depends what are his goals. If he's really happy and if that's the life he wants to live, go ahead, you know? There's no good or bad to to uh, some extent. Of course, you, you should never hurt someone or this or that or break laws, but I, it all depends on the personal, uh, on the person. Like, would, would you say like the high achievers they they tend to if they're disciplined they tend to be disciplined in their whole life if they're patient they tend to extend that to their home life not just their career but, but every part of their life yeah how can we embody that for those who want to who would like to achieve more in their life or who would like to optimize their performance okay first i want to speak about something and this might sound controversial Let's hear it. <laughs> oh, he's uh, getting hyped. <laughs> All right, nice. So um, I said you cannot live, you have one brain, you cannot live uh, focused and disciplined and with patience at work, the long term, focusing on the long term. Um, and when you get home, it's instant gratification, short term, just consuming, you know, producing, consuming. I should say I'm really a fan, and this is a bit of the Taoism, the Taoist in me, it's really about harmony, finding harmony. So you should be conscious of the fact that, yeah, on one hand, you're trying to be patient. And on the other hand, you're training not to be patient with your social media apps scrolling away. But I also watch Netflix. So that's the thing I call smart consumption. It's not bad to watch Netflix. I do it as well. But first I have to do it consciously. So I choose consciously that I want to watch Netflix at that moment or at that time. Well, why? Okay, question. Why would I do that? 
Why is the conscious part so important, do you think, James? Because if you do it unconsciously, you're you're not choosing to do it. You're just following your addictions yeah. or yeah, yeah. your... Inst- bro, if you do not choose, if you do not make the choice yourself, mm-hmm. someone else made the choice for you. Right, yeah. That's where goal setting comes into, is if you don't set goals, society will set goals for you subconsciously, and they may not be what you want. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I do want to add a little bit of nuance. I'm not saying never watch uh, shows or never do that, but that's a thing. Um, You have to find harmony. So my goal is to shape my brain for the long term, my system. I want to read books. I want to be able to read books. If I'm, <laughs> I want to read books. <laughs> that sounds weird. Uh, if I'm only scrolling away, it will become harder for me to read a book. You agree? Yes. I think actually we've, a lot of people have lost the ability to really sit down with a paperback book and read for an hour because they're so used to little notifications going off. And Do you do it? I do do it. And when oh, I nice. do it, it feels so good to come back to that state. It feels like a state of flow. Mm. What's your favorite book, Dan? Oh, I have many. Okay, name uh, some. Name a few. Lately, I've been reading Think and Grow Rich, which is a classic. Of course. It's full of incredible nuggets. Like, it's a classic for a reason. Like, the the moment I started reading it, I was like, oh, I see. I see why everyone's puts it on their recommended list. Mm. It's like every paragraph is... There's not a word that's missing there that's superfluous, that's fluff. Mm. It's it's like nice. meaty. Mm. And so you could read one page and like get so much out of it. Yeah, agree. I, I should actually reread that one because it's, okay, so I it's so mainstream that I almost forget. You reject it, right? Or a little bit? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah. That's why I bring it up. It's like people have a tendency to roll their eyes when they hear a title that's famous. Yeah. But there's a reason why it's famous. True. Yeah. And that's also harmony. Find harmony in that. Like when do you need to listen to society and when do you need to reject it? And most often it's the rejection. Not to be different, but to not be dragged into bullshit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. One thing I've noticed is I I don't read fiction anymore. And I used to read a lot of fiction. Mm. And I feel like there's something something healthy about having some fiction or or maybe poetry in your life. Yeah. Not just the the self-help genre. Yeah. Um I really like that you say that because a mentor of mine uh he he did the same. He started reading fiction. And you should know he has this company he works with billion dollar companies it's a brain and behavior company and like he read a lot of books about personal mastery about psychology about business about this about systems thinking change management whatever not and i asked uh, asked him lately like what are you reading he said yeah some fiction i really like that and he said that the following and it really stuck to me he said yeah you know what I stop with self-help and I liked it already, but asked him, why, why did you stop with reading self-help books? He said, well, implicitly you're telling yourself that you're not good enough. And I found some truth in that statement. I was like, oh, wait a second, self-help. We don't need help. <laughs> mm. Of course you can read to empower or to, read improve to grow. Yourself. Yeah, of course. But the journey has to be fun. Yeah. That's that's also, again, circling back to discipline. Fuck discipline. Make your life fun. <laughs> you know, I like, I laugh a lot. I'm so happy. Every day is a, a great day for me. Of course, I have my down days and moments that I'm sad or even mad or whatever not, but that's also the harmony. It's part of the bigger, yeah, the whole, you know? Just accept it, accept. How do you balance fun that is non-work related? with your work and the things you sort of have to do to to sorry once more once more like how do you balance work and play is basically my question because there's a part of life that's totally play and if you get lost in that you neglect your work yeah also not good 
but there's a certain aspect that we need of play and and for the harmony. So this is actually uh, also part of the book I'm writing. Uh, I also never use the 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 word balance. Try try to avoid that. I try to avoid that because, and this is just something personal. Uh, but to me, balance balancing feels like work life balance feels like you're minimizing one thing to make them equal. You know. Okay. Bringing things in harmony mm -hmm. feels uplifting to me. Like I might have, I, I might be crazy, but uh, so how do I bring those two in harmony? Well, circles back to me for uh, to awareness and habits. Like I force myself during the workday to not grind eight hours, ten hours like in one time i just work in this these little small blocks of intense deep work like two hours no shorter okay to me two hours is not deep work <laughs> when you first start training this deep work no no start with 15 minutes but do you really know what deep work is like i can move mountains in my deep work sessions Explain to me what deep work is. Okay, so I read this book, one of my favorites as well, from Carl Newport. It's called Deep Work, <laughs> so you can check it out. Uh, a really great book. And he talks about two types of work. You have deep work, that's like the intense, focused, like uninterrupted, no distractions, obsessive mode, you know, like one goal, one thing to do, the rest is doesn't exist full immersion yeah full immersion and then we have shallow work that's like answering emails or talking to your colleagues or doing that and this is a, a bit uh, surface you know shallow and they're both necessary especially when you run a business or having a podcast as you know but you have to make the a conscience a conscious decision like, what do I need right now? Is it deep work or shallow work? Usually the essential, most of the essential thing is deep work, in my opinion, at least in my business. And just start pulling those apart. So you have deep work or shallow work. You cannot do both at the same time. So you're either doing deep work or it's automatically shallow. And if you're not sure, it's shallow, <laughs> you know? But why 15 minutes? This is what I'm curious about. Oh, might even start at 10. Because people, okay, so being busy is not productive, being productive. So in motion doesn't mean you move things, <laughs> you know? It's really important that you train yourself to first be conscious, do I need deep work or shallow? And then train Okay, so deep work is a skill. How do you train a skill? Start small. Mm. Start with 10 minutes, but make sure you're not being interrupted. Phone out of sight, not, not only on airplane mode and without notifications, but out of sight. Because if it doesn't ring or do anything, no notifications, and it's still in sight, yeah, yeah, but I'm not looking at it. Well, our brain already saw it. Our system one, <laughs> our subconscious system sees everything, takes everything in. Out so, of sight, out of mind. Exactly, yeah. And then just focus on one specific task. And once you notice that you your mind start drifting, try to circle back to your one singular focus point, the task at hand. And then you, you, you notice your mind wandering again. Don't worry. Don't be mad at yourself, accept that it happened, try to catch it and circle back mm. and try to train that skill. It's about the skill of returning to your intention. Oh, I've heard this great quote. Attention without intention is useless. Ooh, <laughs> that's powerful. Yeah, I think that's from hyperfocus. Attention without power. intention is useless. Yeah. Because that means that you didn't choose it. It's someone else. And that circles back to watching Netflix unconsciously. Yes. 
And you're like, giving your attention to it or to Instagram or to social media. Yeah. But you have no intention. There's nothing. You're not doing it for research. You're not doing it for a purpose. Even, but then when you have the purpose, hey, I just want to entertain myself. It actually makes a difference than unconsciously yeah. consuming it. What would you say are the the top transformational keys for your clients where you see them in a certain state, you work with them, and then something clicks and they've changed? Can you identify that, the patterns that are happening there? Can you specify your question a bit more? Yeah, like when you meet some someone and you start working with them, mm -hmm. what is the transformation that happens for them to start seeing a different worldview? It totally depends on them. Because I know that, okay, for example, my sessions are the deepest work of deep work. I immerse myself completely. And I know that I'm fully committed. I have this passion of empowering you. If you come to the session doubting, oh yeah, is it gonna work? We're not gonna get anything out of it. How hard I can try, how hard I try, it doesn't matter. It's all up to them. Do they uh, come open-minded, willing to change their mind? Are they focused? Are they not, did they sleep well, whatever, you know? And do you want to grow? Like, it depends on them. But once those areas are in place, once those areas are in place, we can start to work. And I cannot really explain what I do because in my opinion, it's, it's an art form. You don't ask Pablo Picasso how he paints his paintings step by step. That's a bit weird. I'm not saying I'm Pablo, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I think just asking questions, observing their body language, um, not only listening to their words, but also listening to things, read between the lines. For example, I like to work with people in real life. Um, and even their, okay, okay. I have this principle, this principle that I developed as a performance strategist and This is for the future once I start teaching others. I'm not there yet, but I will for, for sure in the, two, in the future do this. <laughs> oh, you're going to write it down, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I, uh, you should have sent a, uh, sign an NDA. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, it's everything is data. Everything is data. So the shirt they wear, um, how their hair is cut, for example, Everything is data. So in real life, I can just observe their feet, for example. Like, are they pointing towards me or are they pointing away? Um, are they nervous tapping their feet or not? You know, uh, are their shoes dirty or clean? And does that change over time from session to session? Like, it sounds ridiculous. It might sound, sound ridiculous. You're like, well, observing their makes, feet. Makes a lot of sense, actually. And their feet is like... What, 2% of their body, 5% of their body? I don't know. It's like this little, but I do this with all, everything. And I just take in all this data. Um, not only the things they tell me, not only the things they tell me about their business. Oh, sorry, I should say, uh, when I start working with a client, I always first establish trust and commitment. So the commitment part we talked about, but trust is really important. I tell them I'm not a psychologist, but treat me like one. So everything we discuss, I will never share it with anyone uh, unless you agree to share. Uh, because of course it can be useful also for others if I share some examples. Um, and they should know that, but also, of course you can say, yeah, yeah, I trust you. <laughs> we just met, you don't trust me yet. We have to build that. And I just do that because I do that to show them like, I'm really committed to you. Um, I'm, my, my behavior is congruent with my words and everything. It's just one stream of, hey, my name is Dion. I'm the best performance strategist in the world. <laughs> I don't say this, but, and this is what I do. 
this is my commitment to you. This is what I expect from you. And I, I'm just so consistent in my behavior. Over time, they trust me like I'm their twin brother. <laughs> That's funny because I, I have one client who calls me his twin brother. <laughs> Yeah. And that's that's such a great feeling, James, because with great power comes great responsibility, but also that someone that they, they share things they don't even share with their girlfriends, for example, you know. And to me that's I feel really blessed and honored that I um, am trustworthy and I will always respect that, you know, and treat it really well. Like um uh like like for example a bowl a beautiful bowl from the roman area that's really i i don't know how to say this in english but you know what i mean like if if it hits the table ooh, it might break you know it's really you have to take care of it it's really precious right yeah it's fragile oh f also fragile yeah mm -hmm. yeah everything is data yeah I, i love the way the way you said that down to the feet down to the what they're wearing down to like you said whether their shoes are clean one day or the next what are some of the most interesting things you notice like when you walk around a city and i, I mean i'm sure your awareness is quite uh you're aware of more things than maybe regular people are looking at and so when you're walking around a city what do you notice that is either amusing to you or things that maybe you think people don't even realize what they're communicating or the messaging they're sending i really like this question because this is one of my hobbies <laughs> i bet yeah it's still just people watch <laughs> yeah man god damn it i love that shit so just sit in amsterdam at a at a cafe or whatever sit down might even have my notebook uh, not to <laughs> taking data from random people but to journal thoughts or whatever but no phone just alone also no distractions just sit there maybe some uh, sparkling water observe so circling back to your question one of the f most fun things of course is when people are on their phone and <laughs> strolling into a pole <laughs> or a wall or whatever not seeing a car of course if it if it if they fuck up and get hit by a car i will not be laughing that's that's fucked up but stuff like that the small things or someone tripping over uh <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah i really like that but on the behavior level i really like to observe uh, a, a dialogue this a conversation between two people um because you Well, my mind, so I'm really good with human behavior and spotting patterns. And also I have these models so I can make, I, I almost am like a personality test, but in real time. Like the Myers-Briggs test, really accurate. I don't know if it's science-based, but whatever. The Dion Mensing test. Exactly. And um, I do that in real time and it's, it's became, it became really accurate. But you never know. So I'm observing this dialogue and I'm seeing them talk to each other. And I paint these pictures. So, oh, they are a couple. Ooh, she's mad at him. But why? Why is she mad at him? <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, also there plays a lot of confirmation bias because it's all my mind talking, you know. I, I don't know anything for sure. But it's fun to play, it's, it's a game, people watching. Yeah, I really like that. So just a dialogue is one and uh, funny stuff, random stuff, uh, people tripping because they're on their phone or... Um, also I find um, the most important people to observe and talk to as well are homeless people. Mm. Is it because they're present? It might be just my filter, my worldview because I care more about homeless people than people who are having a home, car, a great job, maybe two cars in front of the house. To me, it's really interesting because friends, uh, I have friends and they say, yeah, in the Netherlands, uh, being homeless is almost like a choice. And 
to me, that's a ridiculous statement. And I know what they mean. They mean like, yeah, we have these care systems and you can um, um, stream back into society. You get helped, you get free help, blah, blah, blah. And that's all true. It's all true. But they forget this one essential thing that you don't know what happened in their past. You don't know how traumatized they might be, you know? And your biggest prisoner is your own mind. Uh, sorry, your biggest prison is your own mind. So it might look like, yeah, he's homeless. Oh, and if I give him money, yeah, he, got, he does drugs. Who cares? It's about caring. That's, I always try to give. When I have money, I always try to give. Um, but I don't, it's not about giving the money. It's about the moment of contact. It's about the connection. Looking them in the eye when you give them the money. Yo, you're not saying it, but, but subconsciously you're, Sending a message like, yo, I see you. You still matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's not... Acknowledging not someone. Yeah. Oh, so important. Because everyone wants to be seen. And those who are homeless are probably the ones not seen the most because people actually actively avoid looking at them. They walk past them. They ignore them. Yeah. Yeah. So sad. Of the seven principles that you outlined... Which one have you worked on the most in yourself? Mm, I like that question. <laughs> I did not think about that ever, actually. Because they're all important and it's a system, you know? So they work together. It, yeah, these are different parts of a system. And you should, like, nurture everyone. Um I think worldview, self-esteem, and energy. And not because those that is the foundation, but I think in life that's where you start, you know? Um, the Maslow pyramid, do you know that? Yeah, with the, the pyramid of needs. Like before you go to self-actualization, you first have to take care of your basic needs, you know? being loved and etc. I think so it's automatically a place to start is your own energy level. Like if you don't have the energy to work hard or read a book or what, whatever, you know, that, that might be the first point to work at. So, and in my life, I always, I've always been active. Both my parents, they are physical education teachers back in the day. Now they do different things, still education. Um, we always had to do a sport, you know, I always were active. I did a um, physical, how do you call it? Like a study. I studied physical exercise or becoming a PE uh, teacher. So the energy part was not, not a problem. Um, I think self-esteem is really normal that, that you're searching developing your identity i should say because when you're young you come like this clean slate tabula rasa you know you come come into this world and you come into a system where they have rules and you have to adapt and i'll well, sit straight and when you want to talk put your hand in the air you know and you have to first adapt a bit you're like confused because you came from the infinite and you came into the finite, you know, and you're, you're like, what? So limited. <laughs> I don't think that you think that because you're not conscious enough at an early age, I think. But then you, you get into this world and yeah, you're, you're adapting, searching who you are, you know, developing your identity. I do like that. I don't like that. Being influenced maybe too much by the environment. You know, um, uh, group think, like you said before. And, but finally, when you st uh, start to find the courage, when you have the courage to know, no, I don't like to go out every weekend, or no, this is who I am, or whatever, not, you know, then you start developing, ah, this is who I am. And you start to build that and also build your character, build your self esteem, and having 
faith and trust that this is who I am and this is who I'm going to be really important and worldview. I think those three. What was your stuff. journey like with self-esteem and self-worth? Was it an easy road? Was there challenges along the way? Of course, everyone has challenges, but to be honest, I've been really happy with my, my childhood. First of all, uh, I grew up in this loving family, both parents still together, um, stable, healthy. I'm really blessed, you know. I credit, also credit like almost all my success to my parents and the way I was raised. I actually get a bit emotional about that, man. Uh, because uh, not everyone is this blessed to have the childhood that I had, you know. And I did not choose um, to be born there. Um, it was faith, I guess. Hmm. What are you the most grateful for of how they raised you? The perfect harmony <laughs> between the ultimate freedom, but also still thinking about my safety. So they let me roam like a lot. Um, I never had strict parents. And in my opinion, that's the best way of, uh, like like as a parent, you're, you are like a, a coach, right? Uh, you can, you're not like a dictator in my opinion. Well, you can try the dictator route. I promise you it will backfire <laughs> because children have this inner motivation to be different than their parents. So, you're like a coach as a parent and <laughs> they were great coaches um, in a sense that they let me roam free, make my own decisions, make uh, let me make mistakes, a lot of mistakes. Also, for example, on the streets uh, doing stuff when I was young, like breaking into buildings or climbing onto roofs, you know, that's all fun and games. It's perfect. But once they start noticing a pattern that it was evolving into more crime, more, you know, they, they said, no, now you're gonna quit with this shit. Stop with the fun and games, bam. But they, they let it roam like quite long. And before that, I, I'm sure that they had moments that they coached me like, okay, but what happens and what did you do? And what do you think, well, whatever, you know? But never like, oh, Dion, you have to do this and go home at this time. Of course, we had rules, don't get me wrong, but nah, they, they let me roam free and that was really important, but they pulled me back at the right exact time. So to me, that's the perfect harmony um, because I'm really thankful that I had the freedom to develop my, my own character, my own values, you know? I have no voice of my parents in my head. And a lot of people do have that. They, they are like, uh, they do something. Well, that's not actually true. I do have it at one particular moment. And that's when I'm uh, not putting my dishes in the dishwasher. I hear my mom, Dion, <laughs> put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> but that's the only thing, you know, and I'm, I'm just really blessed with my parents, man. Just, uh, where do you, where do you think they, uh, where do you think they learned how, like, how did they become good parents? You know what I mean? Was it their mm. parents also had a really positive influence on them or? Um, well, first I want to give a lot of credit to my mother because, um, especially my mother, because she came out of a family. Her mother died when she was five years old. Her father was heartbroken. My grandfather was heartbroken. He lost his wife in a car accident. So there was scarcity, you know, um, poverty in that in that household, and, and also circling back to the Maslow pyramid of needs. When there's not enough food, things get dark, man. Like he was heartbroken. Must provide it for three girls, uh, two at the time, later three. You lost your wife, your perfect wife. Oh, that must be hard, man. So my mother, she had a, I can say a tough childhood. And 
a lot of respect to her because she did not, uh, I didn't notice it. Of course, in the small things, like she was really um, frugal, so really taking care of her money and making sure that, oh no, uh, buy the cheaper one and, you know. And when I was a bit younger, I had a bit uh, adverse reaction to that. No, fuck it, there's enough abundance mindset, and blah, blah. But now I'm circling back to the frugalness, like like the billionaires does, the billionaire does. Um, My mother, yeah. <sighs> I really admire them both. I don't know actually where they got it from to be good parents. I think you also stumble upon it, but they both were physical education teachers. I think they learned a lot from that. Of course, they were used to seeing a different children, but also you see that children got raised by strict parents that, that children, a child by lazy parents. I think you, because they were teachers, they could see it playing out, and I they could so. see certain patterns. Yeah, that they brought home to you. I just thought about that, but I, I think so. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. Yeah, what is one lesson that you've learned from your mom? Frugalness. Frugalness. Yeah, for sure. Like. Um, It's really important that once you have money and your income is at a specific, a certain level, um, doesn't mean you, okay, so Parkinson's law is the fact that if someone get a raise in his income, he will also raise the standard of his living, his, his living standard. Ah, yes, yeah, and it just and, keeps going on. Yeah, so um, it's not about how much you earn because you will rise your your you, you will raise your standard of living anyway you know oh i can buy an even faster car and that will never stop i think that is the disease of more i've heard someone say that i think naval i don't know for sure but and parkinson's law it applies not only to money but also to your time so if you have a project you're working on you know um, if you say Okay, I'll work uh, two hours of deep work. You will fill those two hours with exclamation marks, deep work. Okay, yeah. Uh, not exclamation marks, uh, you call these... Uh, quotes. Quotes. Quote, unquote, yeah. Yeah, like... like. It won't really be deep work. Exactly. Yeah, no. But if you say, okay, start with 10 minutes, and this will be really deep work. And then once you achieve 10 minutes, you can slowly start to increase. Um, so frugalness is one lesson I learned from my mother, like for sure. Like that just doesn't matter how much money you have, stay frugal. Like so important to me. Why should, like even here on Bali, there are all these restaurants it's good food, don't get me wrong, and the people are really nice. We spoke about that, but dude, have you been to the local Warungs? <laughs> you pay like one one dollar forty cents for a great meal. Man, I that feels like a life hack in the matrix or in the simulation, you know? Do you think though there is a there is a risk with frugalness of going into scarcity mindset rather than abundance mindset this is crazy because this is a topic that i discussed with my performance strategist it's a guy i spoke about earlier the the ceo and founder of the company with brain and behavior crazy this was a topic because i was influenced too much by the abundance mindset and that it had like this drip effect on my money management like i was also I knew that there is no shortage of money, especially not if you have a skill, if you can provide a lot of value, you've proven that. So I know I will never be broke again, but it was maybe a bit too much because I noticed that like, oh, I'm just kidding. oh I was too loose, man. So that's the, the, the flip side of the coin. You were asking the different question, but I'm, I inverted it. like. I had this 
abundance mindset, like, oh, everything flows endlessly. It doesn't matter. Also, money flows towards me. But that doesn't mean you don't have to stay frugal. Mm. Bro, that's why I love to study billionaires. Like, um, I can learn from, I've worked actually with, with millionaires and it says nothing. I've not worked with a billionaire yet. It will definitely come. But I think there's a big difference. A lot of people stumble onto success, you know? They stumbled onto, oh, I found this this glitch. Boom, it works. Oh, a lot of money. Oh, I'm a millionaire. Okay, so what? And with billionaires, tell me what, what you've discovered from studying them. It Okay, good question. It's not about how it looks. It's about performance. And this has been my own philosophy for a long time. Um, in my work, I, I've never promoted me. This is my first podcast I do as a, as a guest. Uh -huh. So James, thank you. Thank you. Once again. Thank you. I really like the conversation as well. So, yeah, I don't know, man. It's, it's like you cannot, cannot, cannot be a, become a billionaire by coincidence. You said it's not how it looks, it's how... Oh, sorry, it's yeah. about the performance. It's about the performance. Yeah. yeah, and that's also in my work. Like, I've never promoted my business yet. Only word of mouth. So one client tells someone else in his network, that's it. I'm like this hidden gem, <laughs> sort of say, so to say. Um, and I kind of like that. But this status games that people play, like... Oh, look at me. Oh, look, look at my Instagram. <laughs> it's also one of the first sentences someone on Bali says after you had a good conversation. Yeah, give me your socials. Right, yeah. <laughs> But it's because they want to stay connected as well, you know? Of course. There no, doesn't have to be a, no, no, no. a reason other than that. James, you should know, like, I'm really biased because I found my essence early, you know? I have this, I know what my... Um, what the things are I want to focus on. What is your essence for those listening for the first time? And Okay, so uh, performance over looks is one. I don't care about status. Um, I don't care about social media. I've been more interested in Twitter lately. Also because to me, social media was really one-sided. Uh, I felt a lot of political bias within certain social media platforms. And I feel with Twitter now, Elon Musk, he, he took it over. I'm not saying it's good. He might be a bit too, too uh, aggressive in his change of policy, but I'm happy that we're, we're moving towards the center. But that's a, that's a side story. Mm. Performance over looks. Also, just finding your passion. And that's a bit stupid to say because it's really hard to find your passion. But trust me, it will help you so much if you know what do you like, what does the world need, and what is your, what are you good at? Like those three things. So what do I like to do, my passion? What does the world need? And what, what can I provide? So your skills, skills, passion, and the, the needs of the world. If you combine those three, Yeah, it's so important. And so for you, what you like is optimizing performance. Human performance, yeah. yeah. And the, what the world needs is... <laughs> nice. I think I will accelerate your process. So I'm not saying you will not achieve your goals without me. Of course not. You can achieve it with or without me. But I will save you a lot of time. I will make sure that you become more efficient, that you, I will remind you of your essentials. I will, I'm like a mirror, you know? I will show you, yo, remember in session three you said this? How does that play into this? Isn't that the opposite? He's like, yeah, fuck, you're right. What does the world need? What was the third question? So the what the world needs, your passion and your skill. Let's say someone listening, they don't know their passion. What is a tool they can use to answer those three questions and to truly discover 
something that they can give the world that they like that is congruent on all levels nice nice question um i think it has to do with listening and developing your own voice mm. and try to and this is paradoxical but because it can be done but try to be unbiased mm -hmm. like not influenced by others opinions or the media like like i i once journaled three things and in dutch it all starts with an m uh, mens media maatschappij uh, so mens means uh, human in dutch media is the same media consists of social media and the news outlets and we have uh, maatschappij and that means society in dutch so those three m's i try to avoid and uh, including it, humans well that sounds weird <laughs> i don't mean it in like uh, nothing is black and white like i said before take the nuanced approach so those when there's a problem or an obstacle or when there's a threat to your own voice for example hearing your own voice it's definitely one of those three mm. it's the humans that are talking to you in your environment hey james come on come let's do this and no man you should not do that james you're weird you're weird there's always pressures pressure. and voices from Peer others pressure, of course and finding one's own voices yeah like you said probably one of the most important things yeah. one can do I think so. And it's the most hard thing to do. I think it also comes with age because when you're younger, you're so much more easily influenced and you still haven't had time to develop your own voice or find your own confidence. No, I agree. Yeah. And that... I think as you get older, it actually becomes much easier because you're like, I know what I like. I know what I don't like. And you've assimilated enough data to make your own decisions. And I also think, I don't know if you agree with this, but trusting your gut is kind of goes hand in hand with that because if you don't trust your own intuition and what it's telling you you cannot truly then trust your own voice and it, it isn't that the same your intuition and your own voice i see voices like your part of your personality part of what you bring to the world right like it's like a writer having his own voice but maybe they are the same yeah i think they, they fit together Something to think about. <laughs> yes. That's the second thing to develop your own voice is start journaling. Mm. Like, I always have a journal. I, I filled up like over 30 journals, like already. And not to brag or anything. Well, I am bragging. Uh, <laughs> and for me, it's really important to have journals without lines. Because I consider myself an artist and our brain is like infinite like the things that can stream through our system it's like infinite infinite why would you put lines why would you restrict yourself a little bit of structure isn't bad structure is perfect well for me it didn't work let me just phrase it like that it might work for you and if it does keep doing it but journaling is like one of the best tools because it's like a therapy session with your yourself you know totally agree yeah man do you journal Oh yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I keep a I keep a list uh, a notes app on my phone called oh, you told me, yeah. Morning Pages. Oh wow. I actually it doesn't matter if it's morning or evening, but it's my way to any time I have anxiety or anything that I want to just release. Yeah. I'll go there and I'll just start typing it up and That's I'll, good, man. It's like thinking out loud, but thinking and writing. Mm, beautiful. And it's amazing like first of all how much relief it brings to just put things out there and not have them circling in your head yeah and then also solutions come up because once you've gotten it out now you can look at it and you're like okay but now what can i do about it yeah. and then you journal some more now it's from a solution-based perspective crazy and it's like real-time problem solving and there's something for me knowing that it's there like that i've put it on paper or i've put it on the laptop mm -hmm. i can now release it because I know it's stored in my notes. Yeah. Whereas if Crazy. I don't release it, then it's like, oh, I have to keep thinking about it. Yeah. So I think we're on the same wavelength there of probably how you do journaling. For sure. Like journaling is, is it doesn't matter how you use it as long as you do it. Any way is good. Even if you just draw pictures. Yeah. If that helps for you, 
keep that's why I love the lines because when uh, no lines I mean yes. when I, I like to draw I draw I've tried structured approaches where I would have the same questions every day so it's like what am I grateful for what were the top three mm. yeah things that I was worried about just to try and track if they're the same yeah one of the interesting things I know you're really really structured huh James or no it, it depends on the mode and the context for example we should choose one structure or free flowing which side do you lean more towards i think right now in my life definitely structure okay, okay but there was times in my life where it was all free flow yeah and i think there's there's benefits and disadvantages to both for sure that's why i need to find the harmony yeah you know yeah what was i saying oh sorry. so when i was looking at the journal entries especially when i go back a few months i'm like this is exactly the same problem, just different person, <laughs> different wow. situation. What, what do you mean different person? So like, let's say like I had a situation happen, I journal about it. And then six months later, another situation happens. Mm -hmm. I journal about it too. And then when I reread my journal, which doesn't happen often, but sometimes I'll scroll through it, I'll notice the same pattern appearing, mm. different places, different faces, Yeah, but kind of the same thing. Yeah, And yeah. you're like, ah... It wasn't about that person or that situation. There's a. It was about the pattern. Yeah. And then once you fix the pattern and heal it, Whew. it disappears. Yeah. That 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 is what you should focus on, indeed. F spotting those patterns. Yeah. Also in your own behavior. Hmm. So that that helped for you to look back at old journal entries, journal notes. Yes. And like, oh wait a second. Because you also see progress as well. Some mm. things that I read from my journal going back either years or months ago, I'm like, oh, that thing that I was so worried about, I don't care about it anymore at all. Mm. Wow. It has no... How does that feel? It feels great. It's like right? it's completely neutral or even amusing. You're yeah. like, oh, amazing. I was worried about this thing. And it, it kind of goes to show that we're constantly growing and things that bugged us two years ago, five years ago no longer have that same scary effect. And I think that's part of life is constantly removing those layers For sure. of fear, yeah, separation, shame, guilt, whatever it is. Yeah. Facing it also. Facing like, it. Don't push it away, just embrace, you know? Mm, beautiful. To me, like journaling is like time travel in your own mind. <laughs> like it's so so insane like when i scroll through my old journals and they're all a uh, hard copy like paper man it's like reading a book of my past you're literally reading your old software your thoughts oh nice i right? like that yeah oh dude and like you said also like your prob problems obstacles dude i came to figure figure out like for myself if, yeah, okay, if there is an obstacle, I'm not saying there is, but if there is one, it's just not having enough creativity. Nothing else matters. There's no obstacle. You don't have enough creativity. <laughs> to think your way out of the problem. Bro. Yeah, exactly. Like, what? okay. I think, okay, you, you can think of something smart, so let's try. Think of a problem that I cannot solve with my creativity. But oh no, that's that's uh, too broad of a question. Yeah, the, the search Nothing. matrix is too broad. Yeah, it's too broad. I but I understand it's... your point. Like, uh, you, you know? know? It's resourcefulness as well. Maybe those two go together. Having, uh, you know James Altucher? No. He's um, a really good writer and he has this idea of writing down 10 ideas every day on anything. So. 10 ideas on how I can improve. Oh, wow. X. 10 ideas on how I can I make like more that. money. 10 ideas on how I can have a better morning routine. And the goal for him is not the ideas themselves, but to train the idea muscle. So that when he does get in a shitty situation, like he's going bankrupt or he's talked about like a divorce, his wife leaving him. Yeah. In that moment when he needs cash immediately or when he needs to get himself out of a sticky situation, yeah. the idea muscle is right there and he can he can tap into that. And Beautiful. it goes hand in hand with, I think, creativity. For sure. He yeah. can literally think himself out of situations which his past self was not able to. I like that. 
creativity. It's a really hard uh, subject to study, by the way. Like, what is creativity? How would you describe that? To the, yeah, like it's a mix of inspiration and tuning into source. I think. Mm, nice. Like Exp you mean the eternal? Yes. Okay. Nice. And then expressing that. I like that. There's a flow aspect to it too. When there's no flow, there's no creativity. And when you tap into the flow and you surf the waves, mm -hmm. the mental waves, mm -hmm. now you can you can do anything. I like that. Infinite potential. Mm. Yeah. And I think the only way to study it is through yourself. You know, I've read a lot of books as well, and we talk about self-help and sort of the the limits of that sometimes you need some help james <laughs> <laughs> the 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 best lessons have just come from studying my own life and yeah. studying the way i do things and nice man this is kind of a tangent but you know talking about manifestation for example a lot of mm. people try to manifest they try to study how to manifest good things but actually study how you already manifested everything in your life How did oh, you wow. manifest that bad Reverse thing? Reverse engineer it. Yeah. Oh, wow. How did you manifest the good things, the bad things? Because you can always sense spiritually something before it happens. Yeah, true. Every beautiful big thing that you've accomplished, you kind of knew it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And every failure and tragedy, you kind of knew that it was going to happen too. Yeah. So study that. How does your brain work? Was it through worrying that you got that? Was it through visualizing? Was it through affirmations? And instead of looking at all other people's tools, you mm -hmm. just go inside and you go, how did I already manifest this? Dude, I applaud to you. <laughs> no, for real, because this is to me so essential. Like you don't need someone else's input. Of course, it can spark some inspiration. It can be very ideas. helpful. Of yes. course, of course. I'm not saying don't read books, for example, but like you said, like dive in your own life, dive inside, you know, dude. It's a treasure trove of information, yeah. never ending. Yeah. And even someone, let's say, who has never kept a journal, they can just study the last month of their life. Yeah. And see what worked, what didn't work. This was another thing I learned from nice. one of my mentors is just asking yourself or making a list of things that work. So like, what is really working in your business? And then can you 10x that? Oh, wow. Bro, this is this is focusing on what is your what's the most essential thing, and because almost everything we do is pure noise, it's distraction or it's not even adding real value. Like um, Dieter Rams, he was a designer for Brown, I believe. Yeah, he had this uh, view on life that almost everything is noise, and our job is to find. The signal it's to find the essence he had a that. whole thing about simplicity right and minimalism oh yeah for sure like oh, i love that i believe he inspired johnny ive a lot in yeah yeah it was exactly yeah yeah there was some connection between them and apple and steve jobs yeah i think he also designed or worked together i'm not nah, so know. how did he put it everything is noise yeah almost everything is noise everything we do everything we see and there's a really a uh, few things. There's also in the book, Essentialism. You should read that one. That's almost my favorite book. Essentialism from Greg McKeon. Um, there's not a lot that we do that's really adding mm -hmm. value. And you have to look for those things, you know? Like, what are the things that provide the most value? I first want to hear you answer that question. Like, do you know for yourself what adds the the most asymmetrical value? Like, the things that if you could only... Okay, let's specify the question a bit more. Within your journey towards more personal mastery, yeah, becoming the best James you want to be, what is the one thing you cannot live without? What is the thing that you keep doing till you die? Hmm learning studying okay specify that more how how do you learn 
But let me let me take let me think about it because sure. there's actually so many different answers that are coming up, and I'm tr- I'm curious what is the one. It's hard to it's hard to answer single that, right? it out. Yeah, my initial intuition was actually to say fitness because it has benefits that go beyond the physical. It trains your mind. Nice, makes you more resilient. Yeah, and there's never um, every time you exercise or you work out or you lift weights, it improves you. In so many ways, but James, you see yes. what's happening. Like yes. I'm asking you, what's the one thing? Mm-hmm. And you have all these things coming up in your mind, but you almost don't dare to answer the question. But because you're like, yeah, fuck, if I say this, then that get lost, you know. But it's just a reality you have to face. Like we have to sacrifice the good for the great. So say, give me the question again. What is okay. the so? In your journey towards personal mastery, mm-hmm. what's the one thing you do that you will do for the rest of your life because you know it's the most beneficial for your growth? One thing. It's definitely got to be psychedelics. Ah, my <laughs> man. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Why? Um, <laughs> there's never been a trip that I have not benefited from in some way. And... It is the ultimate resetter, teacher, uh, guide, mentor. It knows my mind better than I know it, and it knows. <laughs> it gives me the homework that I need to. Oh wow! You know, to know. And wow! It's uh, it's a bit different than fitness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Wow! But you're sure. No. It's the one thing that for sure I'll do for the rest of my life. You see how you reacted. Mm, your eyebrows raised like, yeah for sure for like sure confident yeah nice i wouldn't say it's the only thing though right that's where i sort of paused of for a course bit. not but it doesn't have to be we can pick multiple but it is such a powerful tool with the leverage that you get from one mushroom trip and i've spoken to many other people about it too and almost everyone unless they've had a bad experience they agree that what just is a bad experience trip, though mm, What exactly well some people do have very scary experiences and that's not you know i think bad experiences or bad trips you have to reframe them and then they are not bad anymore but in the moment you know people can discomfort for discomfort sure. yeah yeah but discomfort when you accept that because i, I did uh, magic mushrooms as well that's legal uh, or well legal is legal i think in amsterdam yeah it's like well, you can buy it right yeah I, th- i think it's gedoogd that's just a ridiculous thing in our law but let's not get into that mm. so i did magic mushrooms before and to me like the first time that i did it i was trying to have control ah uh, but <laughs> rookie mistake <laughs> a rookie mistake <laughs> i was a bit younger No, we all go through that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is a rookie mistake, though. I was sitting in a in this room, and there was this painting on the wall, and I was waiting for it to kick in. It's also something you should not do. Just let go, you know. Just accept what's happening. And I was looking at the painting, and it started like <laughs> like moving like it was liquid, and my instant reaction was, "No, I don't like this. You know, I need control. No, no." Back in the day, this was your very first time. Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense though. For a first time, I think you're, and for someone you're... who was really into control at the time. Yeah, man, I remember my, my first mushroom trip was also the first half of it was quite confusing because I was like, "What?" I was at a festival with friends, and they were all taking some, and um, like a music festival, music or festival, more artsy with. Kind of music and nature. It was oh, nice. Okay, okay. Beautiful place. So the setting was good. Well, yes and no, because I think for a first mushroom tripper, I shouldn't. Um, there was too many people, mm. and there was not enough privacy to really go inward. Yeah. And you know, everyone else in the group had done mushrooms, and they were just doing it in the social way, sort of taking a little bit and giggling, and you know, just <laughs> telling jokes. Yeah. But for someone who's never done it, it was. It was very just to to find your wings in the experience and understand what's happening. Mm. What do you mean with find your wings? 
So I have the, the analogy of like, sometimes when you take mushrooms or acid or anything, mm -hmm. the ascent can be a little bit bumpy, like a plane that takes off mm. and there's a bit of turbulence. Nice. But eventually you find your wings. Ah. You find, and then you glide and then it's really nice. Speaking about getting wings and flying, James. Yes. Did you jump out of the pla out of an airplane once? I have not. No. Never. Would you fancy? Possibly. All right. Because this is a podcast, but to me, it's also a commitment device. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? I absolutely know where you're going. With oh this. shit! <laughs> um, you're gonna ask me to commit to a skydive? <laughs> why? Let's do it, man. Possibly. Okay. Possibly. W what's holding you back? <laughs> hmm. By the way, I did it a couple of times. Yeah. I have my skydive. I'm a skydiver. I don't okay. know how it's called it. So you've done it multiple times. You've yeah. gotten training. I've got the training. Yeah. Yes. I can jump alone. Yeah. I will I will definitely do it in my lifetime, but I don't know when. Okay. So you're already convinced that you're going to do it. I think so. Okay. I think it's a And how can we pull that closer to the now? Because you also agree we have to live in the now, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we have to be a priority. To me right now it's not a priority. It doesn't Yeah. It's 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 a fun thing. It looks fun. It's super fun. It's like DMT. It was like DMT for me. And not in how it feels, because of course the feeling is different, um, but the principles that apply. So, okay. Ooh, I think I know what, what you mean. Try, try me. Well, so with DMT, when you, you know as soon as you take the hit, that's the jump and there's no going back. And you don't know what's going to happen. You trust that you'll be safe. Maybe there's a, like with skydiving, there might be someone in tandem with you. Maybe there's nope. a shaman, you know, in the session with the DMT. Yeah. But really, they're not going there with you because you're going there. Yeah. And you have to save this, yourself. It's this jump into the unknown. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you have to jump in the unknown. You have to fully commit. Mm. You cannot be half uh, one foot in, one foot out of the door. No, you have right. to immerse yes. yourself completely. Yeah. But also you have to relax. You have to let go, accept what's going to happen, you know? Of course, uh, with skydiving, by the way, in the course, you don't have anyone on your back. Like the first jump, you jump alone with two instructors holding you on both sides. So that I've, was your first jump? That was my first jump. I've never did a tandem jump in my life. Wow, okay. Yeah, we went full full on, did the course, passed the course, yeah. Um, so once you, okay, you're sitting in the airplane and you feel this, this tension. Like you're going up, your instructor telling you, you have to check your alt uh, alt meter, so altitude. You have to do a three pin check. So checking, okay, is this secure? Is my reserve pa uh, parachute in place, bro? And the tension is building up. The same with a psychedelic trip. It's building up and you're like, oh, fuck. It's... All these thoughts flash through your mind. What if I fall to death? Mm. Like with skydiving. Or what if I s get stuck? in the place where there's no space and no time forever. <laughs> All this fear, you, you, you notice these things and that it's confronting you. But once you're at the moment, you have to fully commit. Like you, you perfectly phrased it. Like there's no going back. There's someone with you, but it's your journey. It's your, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. Man. And you got to step out of the plane. Yeah. Just like you got to breathe in the DMT or, or consume the mushrooms. No one's going to do that for you. No. And, and, and if you don't feel like it, you don't need to do it. Yes. Like, let's yes. emphasize that. Absolutely. Because, um, Always go with your gut. Yeah. And only do it when you're ready. I've heard someone say, you might even be the guy who said this to me, but I'm not sure. You don't find psychedelics. Psychedelics, they find you. They, they tend to come into our life story in some interesting way, right when you need them. Yeah, agree. And I was talking to another friend about this, and he's like, from a subjective perspective, like if the world is a dream or a simulation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. isn't it kind of strange that you have these plants just growing 
in your dream world. And when you take them, you have an experience. Objectively, it kind of doesn't make sense. But subjectively... Why doesn't it make sense? Well, it's a little bit out there. Like if you if you designed a world mm -hmm. and everything seems 3D and For normal. example, we are God and we can design the world. Yes. So everything you and you you're you come into this world, you're playing your avatar character and there's rules, there's physics, there's there's certain 3D elements in the game that are not really changeable. Yeah. And then you start hearing people talk about these things like mushrooms and DMT and it just comes up on a podcast or yeah. on a YouTube suggested video. And at first you're like, yeah, it's cool. those are, that is, that is dangerous by the way. Never listen to your algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it knows you better than you do. <laughs> yeah. And that's the problem. <laughs> I mean, from a dream world perspective, the algorithm is also part of the dream. So it's Touché. actually Let's sending go. you some signs. Let's go. Um, and so you hear about these things and at least in my experience, I, I heard about them didn't follow that white rabbit down the rabbit hole, <laughs> but then kept coming up. And you're like, damn, I'm curious. Like and you start diving did. Right. Yeah. And you, start re <laughs> you start reading about it. You start yeah. letting friends talk to you about it. Yeah. And then the benefits might suddenly if someone offers it to you. That sounds sketchy, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Open my fan kid <laughs> or, or you, you feel the call. You're like, okay, let's see what this is about. And then you have this completely non 3d, experience wait because i've heard you say this before we've met a couple times went for coffee explain in really simple terms what is the difference between the 3d world and the 5d 5d world the 5d to me is the more spiritual ethereal realm it's like where for example when you smoke dmt you're not here like you might be in a hybrid you know, you might be in a hybrid place where you're kind of here, but you're kind of there. But what is there? To me, that's either 5D or 4D. Not sure really what to call it. Oh, there's also 4D. To me, it, I, I use these ter terms loosely. So okay. I just want to specify that. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Not a, there's not a scientific basis for me yet. in it yet. I like um, but it's for me, 5D is where things are, they're more, they're not as solid. More infinite. They're more infinite. They're more subjective. It's more an oneness. inner qualia, inner experience that's happening for you. Mm. But it's no less real than the 3D external touch, feel, taste experience. Beautiful. That's how I would differentiate between them. Yeah. You could really just call it subjective, objective as well. Mm. Or inner, no, I, I like outer. yours better. Mm. I like that better. But how do you explain 5D to someone? Well, that's the, that's who's the never been there. Thing is that's you gotta, crazy. you cannot. You have to experience it yourself. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of the design of it as well. If this was a game mm -hmm. or a simulation or a simulation, part of the design is that you must cross that 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 doorway of no return. You must jump off the plane to experience it. Otherwise, there's no. You're not really taking the the courageous leap into the unknown. Mm. And so if, if you could simulate mushrooms and people try to do it through videos or art, yeah, it's not the same, but they try. They kind of evoke a certain essence of it, but you really got to just jump or, both feet into it. Or sex. Mm. Like uh, I found that that is a way to tap in to parts of that, but like... Very true. Wow. Well, you know what Terence McKenna, uh, who was uh, deeply into psychedelics, and he said something like, uh, not trying psychedelics in your lifetime is like never having sex in your life. Hmm. You kind of missed something. Ooh. Like if you live your whole life and you've not tried it, ah. you kind of missed a little part of the game. I agree. And yeah. I thought it was such a brilliant way of putting it. Um, wow. And I like also that in this simulation, the psychedelics don't, they're not like in your face, but they come up and you, it's like an invitation. Would you like to experience something more? Yeah. And for, for some years I said no, and then I said yes. And it's the same with everyone. It's like they yeah. have the free will to, to say when they're ready. 
but the option is there. I don't think anyone can live their life, at least not in today's age, without yeah. hearing about it or, or having that invitation in some way. Yeah, I agree, especially in this day and age. With also all the upcoming research, I'm, I must think you know all about it. For example, the MDMA therapy with mm. PTSD. Uh, Soldiers. Yeah, exactly. Like, whoa, yo. Or, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's up and coming, I feel. I think we're early to the wave. Of course, in the 60s, 70s, hippie They era. were doing a lot of research back then. It was yeah. shut down. I've heard about it. That's cruel. That that should be illegal, shutting stuff like that down. It was all about fear, uh, in my opinion. Like, in that time, there was the Vietnam War, of course. and The war on drugs as well. And the That's war on drugs. That's where it started. Do you know they, those are really color, co correlated? You know why? Why? What happened when you experienced the oneness? You did LSD or DMT. When I did DMT, ah. I felt one with everyone. You cannot really go to war and fight another human. Because you're it. Yes. Yeah. If you realize, not no, not rationally no, but knowing down deep inside, whatever, on like this intuitive, spiritual nature level, how, however you want to call it, it doesn't matter. It's the same. We're talking about the same things. If you're one with everyone, Mm -hmm. you would never not smile or um, or be destructive or harmful towards another person. I would amend that a little bit. Okay, tell me. Oh, yeah, self-defense, you mean. You can or? still have a bad day or not smile at someone. Of course. But you're always going to be more aware of the connectedness of things. And you, I agree. And you bring yourself yeah. back to source much I quicker. Agree. Um, and actually, every trip I've done that's what i've noticed is happening is more and more like the the gap between something bad happened to bring myself back into alignment it's just shortening alignment with with source with your inner god self with your wow. intuition with your power with your nice. love with your trust in the universe that gap before psychedelics and now is, is just a huge difference same james do you need to listen to this because of the way how psychedelic found me this is like story so i knew that there was something like it already popped up a couple of times you know, oh you want to do this I'm like, uh, lsd eight hours are you crazy <laughs> that's a bit too long man <laughs> what if i don't like it <laughs> so i said no a couple of times but i've had this connection with a entrepreneur in the netherlands He's one of the most prominent uh, entrepreneurs, like with restaurants and, and uh, clubs, nightclubs. And yeah, we, we, we spoke and we talk about this and that. We walk sometimes, drink a coffee. I'm not talking to him like daily, you know, but where we can level. And one day we're, we were talking and uh, after we walked together, he sent me this message. Yo, man. Um, I'm doing Bufo, uh, this DMT, 5-MEO wow. DMT. Yeah. Doing Bufo, I think it re will really uh, accelerate your process and really help you, but but you have to make the choice for yourself. I cannot, but I just want to let you know. I have this uh, shaman coming from Colombia. She's great, so just so you know. And and by the way, that's the invitation in the simulation. Yeah, That's the dream world. Of course, it's coming through your friend. It makes objective sense in the story. But actually, it's your dream world talking to you and saying, hey, this is a thing that could help. Well, and it's weird because it popped up earlier. Ah. But there was a difference now, this time. What was the difference? It just felt better to think about accept uh, accepting the invitation because it still was like... Uh, it still was, you're thinking about it and you're like, oh, well. It's scary. It's scary. Yeah. 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 And nice. then the beautiful thing is the universe will keep sending us similar invitations. Yeah. So we, we can go at our own pace. And yeah. Yeah. That's Don't the, rush that's it. The Don't beauty. rush it. No, 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 no. You will feel when you're ready. Absolutely. And when you feel that you are ready, just do it.
It's the I curiosity don't, uh, too. Sorry? It's the curiosity too. It's yeah. like at some point you just get too curious and you're like, <laughs> that happened gotta, to you. I got to find out what this is all about. Well, so he sent some information. I read about it. It was the five MEO, the DMT. And I was like, ah, oh, it's only, it's a maximum of 30 minutes. Wow, that sounds better. Okay, okay. And I was reading about the benefits. And it's also called the God molecule. Just for those listening, if you haven't done 5-MeO, it is probably the most powerful psychedelic and <laughs> not to be taken lightly at all. And I would say definitely not for a beginner, but this is what makes it interesting for that yeah. you've had a really uh, I only did experience magic with. mushrooms before, so I could be considered a beginner, I think. But it felt right. He had a shaman and I just committed just like skydiving. Someone said to me once, and I felt I was ready. I said, go, let's commit. And what I did was we put a date. He said, yeah, it's or then, or then. No, okay, put it in my agenda and try to forget it, <laughs> you know? There's oh, it's a far away. nervous butterflies <laughs> happening? <laughs> of course. Yeah. I was like, fuck. And like the day of the experience, I, I was fasted uh, because that's necessary. Um, I had to do all this. I had to wear all white. Um, it was really, but still I went there. Um, so he went earlier on that day. So my friend was not there. I was with two other guys I've never met in a place in the Netherlands. I've never been in like this, uh, uh, this neighborhood with only big houses and mansions. And we were in this, uh, garden but inside a little garden home, garden home, whatever. All, all these art around us, like beautiful trees. And I thought, oh, the tree of life. Like it all made sense. And once I arrived on the property, there was this and uh, uh, um, this guy, really happy, really uplifting. And I saw him with his yoga mat and oh, he needed to bring your yoga mat. So I knew uh, he's a dmt -er as well. And I said, hey man, you're coming uh, for the... For the, for the experience as well? He said, yep. <laughs> I asked him, did you do it before? He said, nope. He said, me neither. <laughs> Let's go. But it, you just feel like some people, their energy is pure. It's uplifting. I'm not saying they can be a bad person, but I've had the most great experience with my shaman. Uh, her name is Sandra. She's from Colombia. And... The moment I saw her, she was all dressed up with third eye, nice sprinkler sparkles and whatever, not all white, nice white dress, really happy face, good energy. You feel someone's energy. Man. You know if they're, you really do know at your gut level. You know, yeah. Um, not knowing, yes. but like yes. no. Yes, yes. No, yeah, for sure. Dude, all my... But my like my fear butterflies, how you call them, or just my fear, my the jitters, thoughts, <laughs> whatever. It all fell away, like instantly. She gave me a kiss, a hug, and I, I already jumped out of the plane. I already wow, committed. full surrender, full surrender. Yeah, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, and that's all credit to her. She's so great. Um, and then it it keeps going, you know, because the whole experience from start to finish is crazy it's like this big journey mm. first we sat down uh with two other guys i don't didn't know and she was in front of us you know and sat down she was smoking some not smoking but like uh, incense you know those sticks that well whatever so over there mm. we did a guided meditation landed in our bodies and whatever not she explained what it is, it's the God molecule. It grows on the back of toads somewhere in Mexico. And the toads, they live underground for nine months of the whole year, as long as conception of a child. Yeah. Coincidence? Think not. <laughs> no. And once a year when it thunders or when it rains really hard, they come uh, above ground. And that's when crazy humans, they... It's like pimples. It's like a dirty story, but I, I will tell it. They, they squeeze the pimples and you will catch it on like a glass plate and they will dry it in the sun. 
And that's it, untouched by human hands, only the glass. It gets dried in the sun and shipped to wherever. I don't know how that works. Who was the first human to discover that? Exactly, I thought about that. Like, what? How did you think about that? I think by coincidence. But man, imagine if you if you went unprepared into something like that. <laughs> man. Actually, you probably would surrender because you, you wouldn't know what the hell is going on. I think so, yeah. I think... Uh, Yeah. That would be interesting. I'm gonna think about the first it. human who ever did it from a toad. Yeah, what their experience was like. I want. I, I would love to talk to them. <laughs> Should good get them on the podcast. <laughs> no, but man, then after the meditation, after she explained what it is. Oh, by the way, the the, the powder that's dried and get shipped. That's what you smoke in like a vaporizer. Mm-hmm. People used to use a crack pipe, but my shaman said, nah, that's a bit, <laughs> that's not spiritual. That's off vibe. Yeah, <laughs> it messes with my vibe. Don't use a crack pipe for fuck's sake. <laughs> Excuse my language. Now, so, but it was really nice. The way she explained it, not like in a way like, oh, it's the best thing. No, she was like, it's my mission that everyone on the whole earth get gets at least one dose. Mm. And I was like, wow. My type of human. Yeah, oh, well, <laughs> my type as well. Um, and after that, I was sitting with the two other guys next to me. And she asked, so, okay, guys, who wants to go first? Because she needed to guide you into the experience and whatever, not with the medicine. And I was like, I want to go as last. I want to go last. I want to go last. And one guy said, yeah, I want to go first. I was like, okay, good, good. One more. And then uh, the guy next to me said, yeah, I'll go second. So I got my spot. I want to go last. I got. I went last. So numbers uh, two and three, they went out. So me and the guy in the middle, we went into the garden and we had to walk and just relax. We didn't really talk with each other because we were already in this state. You know, We did the meditation, really beautiful. We were really calm, centered. You did not eat. You were really in touch already with nature in this beautiful garden with nice big trees and whatever not. The set and setting was on point. Perfect, like perfect, really. Then the guy disappeared. So I I wondered, okay, he might be inside already. And then I just kept walking, like really in touch with myself, not thinking. I was not afraid anymore. I felt no tension, no discomfort it was just at peace also i this this cat came laying lying next to me and we just i just petted him and then i looked at some birds really in touch already with nature or the source how you call it then she came outside and she said are you ready dion for sure let's go and i walked to her and this is a thing because once i got back into the garden house you know And I saw these two guys laying on the floor, passed out. Like one was in the fetal position, like crawled up. I was like, whoa. And the other one was lying on his back like like this. Not moving, not talking, nothing. I was like, okay. But it was nice. The, the, the setting was nice because there was this nice energy. The music was on point, really relaxing. I sat down. She handed me papers with text on it like about affirmations talking about i'm pure love i'm part of god blah 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 it's like it probably doesn't make sense when you would read it now but i it read resonated. it resonated it was needed and i read it what did you say sorry it resonated it resonated yeah for sure for sure and i read it like it was my own voice my own words it already got me into a state like whoa aligned then she grabbed the vaporizer (sighs) swallow 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 lay down night shades on bro i cannot explain i get chills again dude i (sighs) it was like an explosion i did nah Okay, so I totally lost touch of my body. 
Well, no, you don't think about about the body or this or that. It's just you're you're one. You're immediately I, I became one with everything. Sounds really really weird. I saw this geometrical patterns. You might have heard of that. I felt this pure love, and I th I don't think if she was really singing, but it felt like she was singing my shaman, and like this angel's voice, and oh, I became emotional. And like I kept saying during the experience, like, oh, it's so simple. It's so simple because I knew that life is really simple mm. if you know where to find or know where to, know where, nah. Okay, so, okay, okay. I talked about this uh, with my girlfriend, yeah? It's a side note. Trying to explain like your experience with psychedelics, <sighs> you lost once you started. Right? It's like fitting the universe into the the pinhole of a needle, you know. Like wow! Trying to thread it through and perfectly said, perfectly said. Like it's not possible, but I will try nonetheless. So I felt pure oneness, pure the simplicity of it all, you know. Just love and just oneness. That that resonated with me, you know, because I knew these things. I read the Tao Te Ching, Taoism, you know. I read it like five years already, like almost daily. I've been really deep into the oneness of the universe and, and love and this and that. But now I experienced it, not only intellectually, but dude, with my whole being. Yes. That was so crazy, man. But then... So it, the whole thing was a big experience and it transformed in like, okay, it was perfect, was all good. I got that lesson or I got that teaching. But then my heart was starting to beat in my belly, like really like a discomforting feeling. I was like, huh? I was like, okay, just, just accept it. And I laid my hands uh, on my belly and just started breathing a bit towards it, you know, just trying to relax. Okay, it's okay. It's part of the, the whole thing. But then I think she laid her hand on my hand. And that moment I just broke down into tears. Because for me it was like, Dion, yes, you are really stable from an early age. You had a great parenting, uh, parenthood, you know. You were raised beautifully, no traumas, helping others. But even you don't have to do everything alone, you know. And the, the, only the hand was like a symbol, like, yo, even you should ask for help. Wow. Yeah, and I st started crying. Crying like... <laughs> <laughs> but the crying went over in this laughter, like, dude, I got the lesson. You know, first I got the lesson really deep with my whole being. And after that, it was like <laughs> laughing again, like the laughing Buddha. Mm -hmm. Like... Wait a second, this is great. You're crying and you're laughing. and Yeah, but it, it went so perfectly from crying to laughing. And, and after that, I couldn't stop. It was just, I had my lessons, man. It was just so simple, to be honest. Like, empower others. That's your mission on earth. I knew it intellectually. Now I know it. On a soul level. Whoa, for sure. Like, for sure. I have never doubted it again. One, one moment. I knew this is what I'm doing till I die, till I leave this body. <laughs> I so relate. I so relate to your experience with 5MEO to my experience with the first time trying DMT. Mm. It was a very small dose. It was mm -hmm. from a vape pen, which uh, is, uh, so it's it's quite, you're still here. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not off into space completely. And yet, just that one first hit of DMT, I was seeing frequency. I was seeing energy. Mm. I was seeing all the things that I was reading about in books and and ancient texts and teachers and uh, Abraham Hicks and all of these you know teachers in the spiritual community, which I believed to a degree. But now I was finally experiencing it. I was like, oh, holy shit. They this author right. was right. They were right. They were right. And it was such a, 
just the best feeling ever to finally see it with my own eyes, to not have to rely on some external guru, but mm. just me wow. and the DMT, me and my own experience. Wow. It's not that you're seeing hallucinations. You are truly experiencing something real. And this is very hard mm. to convince someone yeah. who... Or explain. Yeah. Or explain it. But it's it's not like, oh, suddenly a red dragon floats by and you're like, oh, cool, I'm tripping. Especially on DMT. It, Are we it, talking about 5-MEO DMT? Or did you do the... Uh, the one I'm describing now is just normal okay. NN DMT. I've never done that, so... They have, uh, they're quite different, but they have some parallels, I would okay, say. Okay, okay. And the parallels are, are they both bring you to God. <laughs> and they nice. both bring you to love. And wow. they both bring you to unity. I remember on one, later on, I had a deeper trip from a proper pipe. Experience. Yeah, deeper experience. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> and, I, and my shaman taught me. Yes. Like, no, Don, it's not medicine. Uh, it's not drugs, it's medicine. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. So I, I agree, on. I agree. It's not... It's not even, I, I wouldn't call it psychedelics, I would call it plant medicine. Wow, right? beautiful. And like you say, not really a trip, but an experience. Yeah, for sure. And so on a later trip, I had this experience, like you say, of unity and mm. oneness and pure love. And this feeling of like, ah, oh, I'm home. Yeah. I've been here before. Mm. Yes. And the simplicity, the simplicity of it. Did you ha experience that as well, that simplicity? I did not think of it in that word, but when you described it now... I completely relate to that of like, oh, there's nothing to worry about. I'm just experiencing this life for, you know, 80, 90 years. And and then it's off to the next adventure. There's no, you know, when you're an eternal being and you realize your eternity, mm -hmm. you no longer worry about when you're stuck in the 3D mindset, you can mm -hmm. only think of this lifetime. Yeah. But when body. you're, when you're given like this extraterrestrial experience of seeing your infinity and seeing your unity and seeing the oneness with everything, you realize that you never will truly die. And that changes you forever. The The feeling of, ah, this is eternity. I really like that you say this. I totally agree, man. It's hard to, to explain to people who... It's profound. I would say, mm. you know, anyone who feels the call, they should definitely look into that Wait, more. I also want to add a little bit of nuance because I can imagine that if you're listening to this conversation, uh, you get hyped, but it's almost like we're promoting it. It's not that we're promoting it. At least I'm not. I'm just sharing what I experienced. I think you sure. do, do the same. Yes. But I found ways, and I call this LSD less. So without LSD, uh -huh. I found ways to get closer towards the feeling of oneness towards this trip, this, this sorry, exper experience without taking the substance. And it's totally possible. I should highlight that because what people can achieve with deep breathing, meditation, uh, study of Taoism, of oneness, um, trans uh hypnotherapy whatever 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 there are many roads that lead to rome yeah. yes for sure but so, here's a question okay if you had never done the 5 meo dmt do you think it would be as easy for you to enter that state without anything because for me just to, to give a context once i experienced that you now have a reference point and it's easier oh, yeah, to find sure. your way back to it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I do completely agree that you can find your way there without any of these uh, plants or substances. Yeah, but I think they serve a very they have a roadmap. Yeah, they show you the map. Yeah, or at least they show it in their way. I agree. And you can then create your own map with breath work and with meditation and. Yeah, it's yeah. I agree. Of course, it for me it's a tool now. Like I did it once. Um, I did it well. The setting was right. You did it in the most safest way, I would say. Yeah, and also under guidance of a real shaman, you know? She was doing this for over 10 years. Very important. Yeah, very important. Mm. I think, of course, it might help, but I think it's really important that people don't underestimate the power of nature in itself. Like... Uh, first start 
for example, fasting, intermittent fasting, like that already is a form of getting closer to nature. I don't think humans were made to eat all day long, 24 or wait, 16 hours a day, you know, just snacking, meal, snack, meal, snack, meal, no. I don't think that's the thing. But for me, for example, if I fast and I fast for 18 hours a day and only eat within six hours and eat two meals and I don't snack in between those two meals either. So, and then you take mushrooms. <laughs> exactly, James. <laughs> and then it hits you harder. <laughs> yeah. I see where you're yeah, going of with course, this. Bro, yeah. <laughs> well, no, but it, it, it works together because why would my shaman tell me, Dion, don't eat this for a week, don't drink alcohol, uh, don't consume dairy or meat products? Why? Because there's hormones in them. It, like when you come clean yeah. and light, and there's not too much caffeine and sugar no and stuff caffeine. going on. No, no. You come clean to the ceremony or to the, the experience. Yeah. It does make a huge difference, I think. And yeah. But you were talking about it in a non-psychedelic way as well. Yeah, you're trying to... Um, it's like a debate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to promote... Uh, no. No, no. Like, there's no good or bad. I'm just saying, if you're, you were listening this con to this conversation and you feel like, yeah, I'm not ready yet, that's okay, you know? Try to experience with the natural stuff, like breath work, meditation. Um, always consult your doctor or physician or nutritionist or whatever not, you know? But Consult your shaman. Fast. <laughs> let's go yeah yeah man so i really like the stuff like that just just biohacking also you know yeah you mentioned meditation and i think that's a really important one for me meditation is is super important i never used to really do it until i started doing mushrooms and mushrooms to me is like a forced meditation because you're in a certain container for eight hours nine hours and it's just you and you and then i started doing it without anything and just you know lying down and going through the inbox of my mm -hmm. thoughts mm -hmm. and i know that you can relate to this and i'm curious to ask you about your meditation practice and how it's changed your life mm. i will tell you a secret lately i've not been meditating since i came to bali i've not been meditating anymore when you come to Bali, there's this energy, right? There's this peace, there's this calmness, like everything flows effortlessly. Like for real, like I did not need it, my meditation. Also, I tried it once. I could sit for over an hour. Like I was like, yeah, this, this feels pointless right now. And that, that's, that might sound weird, but Back in the Netherlands, I can really benefit for, from meditation because it's more high-paced. Um, people are more like, bah, 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 you know, going, going, going. Then it's a, a tool for me. And what I do is I just sit down without a real cause. I'm not saying a mantra, not focusing on my breathing. Just sit there. It's also like an, like an experience, like skydiving, like surrender. What happens? You know, just letting go experiencing the what happens if you your brain wants to paint a picture of the future sure go visualize if you want to reminisce and think about something from your past sure do that you know if it wants to be quiet it is quiet you don't even notice it until you do and then you're thinking again well i was quiet for so long wow beautiful or it just wants to solve a problem you know but I've noticed that once you, when you do that more often, and once again, on Bali, I don't meditate, but when you do that more often, you, you notice that you become more at rest. Like your mind becomes clearer and clearer. You get more mastery over the monkey mind, how they call it, you know? Defragmenting the hard drive. How, how do you say it? No, I, I, I use a metaphor of like defragmenting the hard drive. What do you mean by that? So it's like you're, you're going into the hard drive of your brain. Yeah, yeah. And you're just your rearranging system. the furniture and making sure everything oh, wow, is neat. For real. And then it, for real. it runs smoother. This is a concept that, that's really important, actually. Uh, it's envir environment design. So 
I have this, I, I've thought about 10 principles. I call the, them the key 10, like dance principles. So one of them is uh, environment is the most powerful shaper for behavior and state. Because what does that sentence do to you? What if you hear that? What, what, what's, what's coming up in your mind? Uh, truth. Like, I feel like it's very true. That's what's, why it's a principle. <laughs> yeah. Environment is... The most powerful shaper for behavior and state. Yes. And environment is the people around you. Everything. The, everything. The, yes. the furniture, the room, how clean or messy your environment is. Yes, for also sure. Also, the food around you, Internal, the music, the... External. You were talking about rearranging the furniture internally that's internal environment design that's so essential like that's that's okay circling back to discipline you don't need discipline if you're a master at environmental design environment design that's a fact why is that because if you design your environment internally and externally for the goal you're trying to achieve, success is your only outcome. You don't have to force yourself. You don't have to do this. Don't get me wrong. It takes time to get there. It takes effort to get there. You made me think of something though. Would sure. it be fair to say that the reverse is then true, that the reason someone doesn't achieve their goal is because their environment is blocking them in some way? Yeah, for sure. So for sure. if they could rearrange... Either internally or externally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually it's internal, more internal. Oh, I don't think I can do that. Or And so you're, you're saying with the right environment, the goal becomes a, a smooth journey to get there? No, the goal is inevitable. Inevitable. Of course, you will get there. Success is the only outcome. But you have to structure it well. And that's what I do with clients. I'll help them. I'll help them to first make sure what is it that you're trying to accomplish and then we're going to structure their life because everything is a system. Your body is a system. Uh, you know, it consists of parts that interact with each other, but also you within your peer group, within your environment, your network is also a system. Everything interacts with each other, you know. We already decided everything is one. Everything is one oneness, but... What are the interaction between the things in your environment? Starting eternal, internally, like personal mastery, you know? If you master yourself, you become master over your life. <laughs> so cliche, but so true, man. Like, Would you agree that the internal is more important than the external? Or would you say they're both equal? Is there a difference? That's my question. Well, depends what frame you're looking at it from. Okay, that's the easy answer, but let's dive into this because you told me like we're not seeing with our eyes. So even everything external is actually processed internally. Exactly. So you really only have to work on the internal world to have effects in the external. Yeah, well... I might be simplifying it yeah, a okay, bit this, here. But, so but, but the, the, the core is right. Yeah, focus on internal first, in my opinion. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I love to build a business and that consists of a, a, a product, you know, a market need. Uh, how do we market the product, et cetera, et cetera. So that's also external, but it starts internally. Like what do I, uh, what is my worldview? You know, how do I think of business? Do I think business is a zero sum game? Bro, when I win, you lose? No, it's win-win. Dude, I've never put money, I, I, of course, money is important. We need money to survive, take care of our friends, family, whatever. I've never put money on the first place. I always focused on providing value to the people I work with. Um, and the fun thing is, that's the best way to get money. Because money is never the goal. It should never be the goal. It's a second order or maybe a third order consequence of providing value, mm -hmm. right? Would but, you agree? Yes, yes, 100%. Yeah. It's a side effect. Exactly. And it's like, I think my friend used this analogy of like, you're trying to get a fire going, 
but you won't put the wood in. You just want the fire to happen. The fire is like the consequence, the money.、Mm-hmm. You have to put the wood, and the wood is the value. And so, if you just put out value into the world, it will come back to you in unexpected ways. Not yeah, only in money, but、I、also、agree. in connections, friends. Yeah, the impact you have on someone. I think people underestimate that when they're in a scarcity mode. That sometimes the sweetest thing is not the money you receive from someone, but knowing that you've made a ripple, a positive ripple、mm. in their life. I used to think, yeah, bro. Sorry, I agree a lot. Like the ripple, dude, it's a butterfly effect. Yeah, and I, then they create their own ripples in their family and their friend group, and it just keeps going. And and that's how we change the world, James. One person at a time. That's why I, not to constantly bring it back to mushrooms or psychedelics, but I do think that that is one of the most important pieces. That if people, if more of us start doing psychedelics and we shift ourselves, the ripples that we'll create、mm. are extraordinary. Because if you have, let's say, I was talking to you about this earlier, if, if a billion people on the planet、mm. all took mushrooms at the same time, at the same time. A synchronized trip. Shit, I like this. Can you imagine the next morning? <laughs> Yo, social media would be full of love. Yeah, for real. Now, people, cynical people, might say, "Well, it won't solve every problem, but it will shift so much internally for every person that literally the world would not be the same." James, okay, please promise me one thing.、Mm. Keep this goal in your mind's eye. Oh yes! Like, please value this one because I not only agree; I think it's essential. We live in these times; people are totally lost, getting programmed every day by external fo- uh, fo- uh, forces. You know, like it's time to start sharing truth instead of misinformation. Like, we have to share. Like, yo, we are one. Yes. Like it, and not share, but they have to experience. Yeah, every、true. single person, and that's the beauty of the、so、James. James,、yes. promise me. <laughs> I promise. Yeah, you keep it in a hundred percent. All right, <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> it's happening, bro. I think the beauty of psychedelics is they don't preach to you, and it's not a guru telling you what to do. It's you and the plants. It's you and your higher self, and that's what creates the shifts that are really impactful、mm. for me, at least. That's how I've. In my experience, because if someone had told you love, unity, oneness, without the five meo, someone just said that to you, you're like, "Well, they're losing it, <laughs> losing it." You'd be like, "Okay, great, love." I felt that, and it wouldn't be like, "No, I know." There's and then, knowing, and, and then、that. you experience it, and you're like,、yeah. "Whoa!" And I'm not the same person anymore. And going forward into the world, you're on a different timeline. How has your relationship with reality shifted after a five meo? Do you see the world differently now? Yo, it was、uh, yes. To be honest, I attuned to it again a bit more, so I got used to it. I think,、um, or it slowly decayed, decayed a bit.、Um, but what I noticed, like, <laughs> dude, I cried. I cried about the smallest things, but also beautiful things. Like one day, it sounds gonna sound really weird if you never experienced this, but stay with me. So one day I went shopping. Okay, I needed some organic foods, so、I、went to the organic store, and I noticed that I had this connection with animals. Like dogs would come to me and lay next to me, like randomly, randomly, an incident. And I was like,、ah, "This never happened before. Like, what? This is crazy." So you feel more in touch with、uh, things close to nature.、Uh, trees were more vibrant, more alive. My friend said he started talking to plants after doing ayahuasca. <laughs> yeah, doesn't sound weird to me. Like, I totally understand.、Um, but I was walking into the shop, and there was this baby in a stroller. And we had eye contact, and it was like we both knew how the universe worked. Sounds really fucking weird, but it sounds like we understood each other and the universe through a look in each other's eyes. 
And then it just hit me like, it was really beautiful. I was like, whoa, we get each other, you know, nature. And then I walked to the beans and I started crying because it was, was such a beautiful experience, you know. Also stuff like the dogs that just coming to, to you and lay next to you. Like, eh, ah, you cannot explain it, you know. Maybe it's because you've, you're, you feel so connected and at one with the universe during the trip. That energy carries over into your day-to-day -day life. And so you then connect with dogs and connect with... Yeah, but you cannot explain it. No, but you can experience it. That's the only way. Yeah. That's... I've, I've stopped explaining things to people. Mm. <laughs> Unless That's... they've been there and done that. I really only talk about my stories. Yeah. But not in an attempt to convince anyone of anything. You, try, you do try to educate, right? Just to educate those who are curious, sure. Mm. Yeah. And share what I've experienced. But never in a way of oh, you must try this because no, you cannot, you cannot enact on someone's free will or you cannot, um, how do you say, disturb someone's free will. No. They, they have to want to do it themselves and when they're ready, they're ready. Just like we said, like it finds you. You don't find it, you know? So it doesn't, it only helps to educate. Like, yo, this is what it did for me. You make your own choices. And that's how the world should work that's why i'm uh i'm pro free speech you know like don't tell me what i can and cannot see like censorship of course we need to censor like um um abusive videos or whatever like shit that's dangerous or harmful to people of course get it off the platform but stuff like opinions about political stuff don't censor that that's fucked up. And that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, we're seeing that being undone with Twitter. So Twitter had this um, left-leaning extreme bias and they and that got dripped through in the censorship. You know, they decided, not the algorithm, but they decided what's harmful uh, and, and what's not, you know? I'm not saying they had bad intentions. I'm just saying this happened and it's being thrown out now in the world. But right now you're seeing that we went from a left-leaning bias to Elon Musk who tried to pull it to the middle, is what he's saying. He might go over and go more right. I don't know how it works, but to me it felt liberating because I felt this happening also during the pandemic during COVID, like what? Like like certified doctors got censored online. Yes, yeah. Like Stanford, uh, uh, like educated, Stanford and educated doctors. They had this great idea, the great Barrington de declaration. And at the time of reading it, I, w I felt all this faith in humanity. I was like, wow, yeah, we can uh, conquer the pandemic while uh, being able to see your grandparents or what, you know, it, it showed a different kind of world, but it got censored because it was against their current ideology. And, okay, circling back to my point is right now we were left leaning on Twitter, for example, it gets pulled, uh, the intention might be to pull it through the middle, but how does that feel if you're used to left? So your worldview, if you were not aware that this was happening, and you were left-leaning, in your worldview, you would think, this is normal. So if someone pulls it to another side, doesn't matter what side, pulls to another side, it feels off. It feels, yeah, what the fuck? This is extreme. This is, he's bad. But It's a really good point. It's like, again, the example of the fish in the water mm. not sensing the water. Yeah. Or not knowing that there's an outside of the, the fishbowl. So the, the left-leaning people who felt like that was the normal mm -hmm. never realized never really acknowledged or had the awareness to say hey i'm actually on the left it might I'm, be i don't know you know and now it's being pulled towards the center and i hope you, i don't know you know yeah you make a good point we have to see that but it, it makes a bigger point it's not about twitter or about elon musk or what he's doing even though i think it's a good thing only time will tell you know because it will disrupt some people make people mad you know 
But one thing that for me is really important is that you be aware that your worldview is not a shared worldview with everyone. Everyone lives in their own fishbowl, you know? And it's really important to acknowledge that, but also keep talking. That is the key point. That's yes. the key point. I think some people realize they're they're in their own worldview, but they judge the other worldviews as completely zero sum, bro. Zero yes. sum. It's not good. And they're not open minded to go, hey, you know, maybe there's some aspects of that worldview that makes sense, or maybe I don't agree with it, but I'm not gonna just discard it completely. Let's uh, let's try to do that. Let's uh, promise that we will always try to stay talking also with the other side, the other side. <laughs> like just talk and censorship to me is the opposite of talking. <laughs> it's deciding that this debate should not be happening because I think this. That. There's a lot of disruptions happening right now and I think it's all good. I think all of these ripples in the matrix. I feel a lot of things happening. Yeah. Like there's this, it almost feels like a battle between evil and good. I'm I'm not saying I know who's evil and who's good, <laughs> but it feels like there's this energy. Uh, how do you say that? Con uh, collision. Collision. Yeah. There's a collision between forces. Like I feel it. Like there's this push and pull game going on. Only time will tell. But I do know privacy is important. Freedom is important. And I've heard a sentence once. Uh, I don't know who the author is, so we should think about that. But if you sacrifice your freedom for extra safety, you're not worth both. Yeah, you're, you'll get neither. You'll get neither. Yeah, mm -hmm, thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something like that. Something like that. It's It's a powerful quote. Really powerful, and do you know what it exists? What it means? Well, to me, it means safety, safety, and framing, and whatever not can also be used to push a specific agenda. Oh yeah, you should this do this because that's dangerous for you. I will take care of you. It feels good, right? Someone takes taking care of you, yeah. right? So, you know, safety is one of those words that I think is really being used as a as a weapon. Wow. I didn't want to say it, but yeah. It's true. It, and I, I, Framing I, as well, by the way. I come back to, I think it was Helen Keller's quote, that there is, there is no safety in nature. It's mm -hmm. a made-up construct. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that, oh, we must keep everyone safe, well... <laughs> Who is to decide what is safe, what is not? Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you some final questions about yourself. Okay. And then we can uh, we can wrap it up. What is your favorite part of being you? That I have, that I never have to look behind my shoulders, because I know I'm pure. Mm. Pure intentions. Yeah, like I've heard this quote, uh, never lie and you never have to remember your lies or something like that. Like it sounds so funny and simple, but it's the way I live. Like, d don't get me wrong, of course, uh, a small lie. Oh yeah, I was late because of the bus or wh whatever. I try not to do it, but it slips in sometimes, right? We're human. But like things that matter, be honest, be willing to, take the hard route and confront someone because the easy way out is not calling that guy, is not connecting him. But no, I need to do that because, and that that's what I really like about myself is I'm really light. I don't carry luggage or weight. Oh, I like that. Yeah, but that, that, that also helps you move really quick, you know? Yes. Because when someone screws you or, or says, oh, you did this, you know, no, I know myself. And I know who I am, so I don't care about your fake news. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's a Trump impression, by the way. So stay light. Keep yeah, the baggage light. Light luggage, man. I love it. Yeah. What three words represent the core essence of who you are? Personal mastery. Those are two words, but let's 
consider it one for now. Taoist, I would say. Taoism is really a big part of my life. And love, mm. the third word. Yeah. Wow. The most important one, probably, too. Yeah, for sure. They're all so connected, of course, but yeah, for sure. And DMT is in there somewhere. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, that was pure love. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, just as a, real, a short side note, like, I feel this deep connection to my shaman. Uh -huh. And I've met her twice, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like she's my second mother. That's, that's weird, right? But I love that shit. I love that. Yeah. She went with you on that journey. Yo, she guided me. What is the most important lesson you learned this year? Well, this year I did DMT. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> that was the lesson. <laughs> I got you. Um, I think it had to do with that. Uh, the lesson for me was the that the confirmation that I'm here for others, empowering others, you know? That was like my mission here on earth got really clear uh, through that experience like yo dion don let's go you know empower them go 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 it made me go so much faster because if you're doubting like oh should i do this or should i do that for example you will not run as fast as if you just say yo this is my mission here on earth mm. doesn't mean i don't do other things like i want to become a great father I'm for sure going to have a lot of employees in the future, even though employees can be a headache. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Stuff like that. But it's because my mission is clear, and that's what I learned this year. It's been building for years now, since 2018. It was already my business full-time. But right now it's like in my whole being, yo, this is why I'm in this human body mm. in this time. On this it's embodied earth. yeah yeah oh wow yeah. nice yeah it's embodied what do you most value in your friends they accept they accept me who i am like instant answer because i spoke with the uh about this uh some people called me weird a lot in in back in the day in high school oh you're so weird you know but i always saw it as an asset not that I wanted to be the weirdest guy. No, but I felt, yeah, because I don't want to be normal. Mm. I don't want to be in the gray mass, the, everyone the same, you know? I want to have some color, you know? Everyone is like a painting with different colors, different shapes. And that automatically means that you're 100% different than everyone else. But people adapt, people try to fit in. So, and my, my group of friends, they really accept me. Like, <laughs> they all agree, yeah, he, he can be weird as fuck. <laughs> but they accept me, and I love them for that. They, they just show unconditional love. I think that's the most important thing in, in a yeah. group of friends, especially really close friends. That's yeah. what they're there for. Yeah, I really am grateful for that. If you could spend time and learn from one person living or dead, who would it be? Lao Tzu. Like, Lao Tzu, he wrote the Tao Te Ching, Taoism, but Lao Tzu in ancient Chinese means old man. So he was, he, nobody really knew who he was, you know? Ah. Like, just like with Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto. Right. You know, nobody knows. Right. So that that is a starter, but also because he, he to me, he described how to live life in harmony in 81 verses. Like the original Chinese text consists of 5,000 Chinese characters in total. So he, he described how to live in 5,000 Chinese characters. Dude. Simplicity. Simplicity. Subtraction, like this guy was a genius. I would love to learn from him. I would also think that I would stumble upon his 
he would be able to teach me, but I also think he would not be teaching me. Because one thing in one line in the Tao is it does nothing but leaves nothing undone. So he would not teach me, he would not do that, but he would leave nothing undone. So yeah, Lao Tzu for sure. <laughs> wow. Very cool. Who inspires you? My potential, my potential future self. Mm, that's a great answer. Yeah. And also, no, nothing really comes up to my uh, up in mind. Wait, let me try because this is silly. Uh, Bill Campbell. He uh, he was known. He sadly passed away, but he was known as the trillion dollar coach. And I stumbled upon a book that was written uh, written about him. He coached uh, the high CEOs from Apple, Eric Schmidt. Uh, Sundar Pichai, I think, as well. He coached Steve Jobs. Um, Got to check this guy out. Yeah, Bill Campbell, for sure. And he was named the Trillion Dollar Coach because the people he coached, they had businesses with a combined net worth of over a trillion dollars. Well, today that would be multiple trillions of dollars, of course. But he really inspired me. Um, I stumbled up, uh, uh, upon his book from a mentor. And uh, he gave me the book and didn't give me context. He just, yo, read this. It's like, okay, sure. I was already into my business and stuff like that. And it sounds weird. And I don't want to say I'm Bill Campbell, Bill Campbell, whatever. Of course not. He's a fucking legend. I'm just building. But it was like I was reading about myself. Like bringing the love into the workplace, like, thinking about the humans first, you know, instead of the rational number game. No, there are no businesses. It's about the human, empowering the humans, you know. Nah, he really inspired me. It's a crazy, crazy guy. Is there a piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Master the mundane. That sounds like something I've heard before. Yeah, I think I've noticed. I think it's from John D. Rockefeller. Master the mundane. I think so. It's about find the things that look really simple and master those. So the essentials that you know that are really important, like reading or journaling. It's really simple. It's really mundane. You know, oh yeah, I read a book. It's not that popping or dopamine triggering, but master those things, master patience. I know it's it's easier when you have to stand in line and wait, it's easier to grab your phone, of course, but master the mundane. So stand in line, <sighs> do nothing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's really a big thing. Final question. What is one piece of advice that you would like to leave the listener with on how they can lead a more epic life? James, you're throwing these on me like it's easy to answer. Like <laughs> I know, I know. Oh, man. Can you repeat it once more? What is one piece of advice that you want to leave the listeners with on how they can lead a more epic life? Go offline, develop your own voice first. That's it. Beautiful. Dude, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you in the studio. Likewise. Being the first... Uh, this is your first time as a guest on a podcast. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thank you for... Well, I did some unofficial ones with uh, some friends. Ah, but, but we won't count them. No, <laughs> you're first. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thank you, man. For real. You've been listening to the James Zander Trip Podcast. Thank you so much to Dion for his time. You can find Dion on Twitter at Dion Mensink. All the links are in the show notes. For more conversations like this, be sure to subscribe to the James Zander Trip podcast on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple, and please leave me a review. It really helps me out. Have a beautiful, blessed day, and I'll see you in the next episode.